This episode of the Closeout Bodyboarding Podcast is proudly presented by Bodyboarding Victoria and Function Bodyboards. Check out the all-new range of Function Boards, including the Joe Clark, Chase O'Leary and Bradstone models at your local bodyboarding or surf specialist store. Or online at www.function.com. Now, back to the crew in the studio. Welcome to the Closeout Bodyboarding Podcast, where a few good mates discuss their love for bodyboarding. We'll also chat about a few of the current topics that we're also looking forward to in the sport that we're also bloody passionate about. I'm one of your hosts, Benny O'Born, and joining me fresh from a hot and steamy getaway in Byron Bay with his beautiful wife, Nikki, Shane Britton. How are you, buddy? Thanks, Benny. Thanks for having me. We are also incredibly lucky to be joined by a very, very special guest host today, Chris Watson. <laughs> Welcome to the podcast, mate. <laughs> Contract well, negotiations you. are over. <laughs> yeah. The picket lines have gone yeah, down. It's, it's all been signed. It's all, all done. He's back. Mate, what, uh, what was it? that what, what got you over the line? And back on board. I was actually back in the country. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't a decimal point being no, moved on no, the ledger. No, no, I think I think since we recorded the the last one, I think I've been overseas three times. Yeah, since you record the last one, we've recorded about six. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we've got oh, the quality mate. people in there. <laughs> oh, folks, this episode uh, a little bit closer to home. Where. Uh, going to have a chat about the history of bodyboarding in Victoria with one of the, well, the godfather of the sport here in this beautiful, cold and dangerous state. Uh, he's also the father, biological, I hope, um, <laughs> <laughs> and mentor for uh, Chris Watson. <laughs> uh, welcome to the closeout, Steve, a.k.a. Spocko Watson. Thank you, guys. Spocko. Yeah, we Thanks haven't done a DNA, so we'll try it. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it's best not to know, yeah? yeah. <laughs> 70s were pretty wild. <laughs> was, it, was another Watson part of Chris's negotiations? We had to bring another Watson in. Yeah, here. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Who's Sam? <laughs> <laughs> nah, Spocko, seriously, like, thanks for coming on to the podcast. No worries, guys. Uh, we really um, appreciate it. You know, no, we really good. want to deep dive into, you know, your history with bodybuilding here and um, get a better understanding of sort of what's going on. So, as part of that, um, you've been living on the peninsula for many years. And many, you've got a many, long many history yep. with down here. Can you give us a bit of a background on that? Well, but basically, I actually wasn't born on the peninsula because when mum and dad came back from the war... Um, they um, got offered a job as, as uh, managing a property in R- uh, Riddles Creek, of all places, when in the 40s when there was nothing happening up there. Yep. And they lasted up there till 62. So I was born in Gisborne, but they came back to sit in 62 and then the rest of life, life had been down here. Right. So, yeah. So that was uh, a long time ago. I'm born in 58, so I'm 65 at the moment, or almost 65. Uh, and I'm living in Fingal. Victoria, which is not like Fingal in uh, New South Wales, there's also one in WA, but behind Gunnamatta Beach. Yeah, which is stone you know, throw from Gunnamatta. Ga- yeah, Gunnamatta and and, and Beach. And too. Beach. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Also, we've sort of uh, the Watson family's had quite the history on the peninsula. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, well, uh, Chris, you're sixth generation. I'm fifth, and your son is seventh generation down here. So, we've been here a long time. Um, your great, great, great grandfather was invited down to Port Arthur and uh, in 1834 and he met Mary McGarrity and Mary McGarrity, a bit of a wild girl. She'd burnt down Josh Leggett's house in Ireland. Um, <laughs> they were very young, so I think it was a lover's tiff. And your, <laughs> definitely, your, um, your great-great-great-grandfather was called James Watson. And from then on, there was four James Watsons after that. Right. All in a row. They were pardoned, married in Westbury in Tasmania um, and had kids there. They came to Melbourne and their son came down to the peninsula. And what he did, he met the Kane family. If you imagine the peninsula in the 1850s, there was only probably about two or 300 people max, not yep. even that. No Range Rovers. No. Nah. No, nah. um, <laughs> nah. no. No estates. No estates. No, no uh, North Face puffer jackets. So, so <laughs> they, they met, he met people called the Kane family, going back to that, and they were from Tyrone County. Now, my, the um, great-great-grandmother, 
Mary McGarrity, she was for Tyrone County too, and they got talking, and lo and behold, all of a sudden they were from the same area, and a lot of the Irish did come come down this way, and through the 1850s and whatnot. So they got to know each other, and um, lo and behold, before you know it, they're you know working for each other. Um, there's uh, only two houses in Blair Gary at this stage in Rye. Um, one was the Watson House, and one was the Hill House and the Kane House, and the Watson House had a um, was a James Watson, the third James Watson, and he met um, a hill, the daughter of the hills, and they married, and then they had kids, and they had my father, and then of course came me, and then Chris. Oh. So it's gone on for generation. Mainly our main, most of our history is in Blair Gary, um, and it's the Watson Street. Street. There's a Watson Street. That could have been there's two another Watson family around the area too. Claim it. Yeah, Claim it. We do. Yeah. We do. Well Perfect. there used to be a Watson Street and Stephen Street went into it, so I was pretty stoked. <laughs> yeah, it made sense. But also there's a, because there's there's this extended um, family, you know, I, because there's only 200 people, everyone's into bread right through Serrano Portsy and Blair, Gary and Rye. Um, the, you know, we've also got another great great grandfather who actually jumped ship at the heads. Um, in the 1850s called William Webster. And because uh, during that time, there was gold everywhere and ships would come in and they didn't have crew to go out because they'd all just desert. So he bailed, him and his mates bailed up everyone at the heads and the quarantine boat came out and they bailed them up, locked them up and then jumped ship and shot through. Went to Bendigo, made, made money, not a lot, and then came back down and settled down here. But there's many stories about the family that, you know, around the area, as a big family and whatnot too. I mean, Seriously into bread, but you know, I'm not too many two bits. <laughs> the, uh, like you wouldn't believe. <laughs> probably one of the other things is as well. Um, just on that point, the James Watson. So um, I have it in my. I have it as a middle name, uh, James. So I'm Christopher Stephen James. You know, Dad's Stephen James Watson, and my son's Noel Allen James Watson. I thought yeah. it was really important to keep that going Seven along. Generations through. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, the James name follows through, and yeah. hopefully we can convince Noel to just not the Chris name. That one's not going to follow yeah, no, through. No, 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 go. yeah, no, no deal. <laughs> but it's kind of funny because if you think in those days too. Um, we, we talk about surfing quarantine and stuff like that. Like before the army owned quarantine, it was actually owned by the Sullivan family. Not owned by, but they leased it. And all the land was pretty well leased on the peninsula. And there were big tracks. Like the Kane family had from one road, because of course the peninsula is a narrow point with a bay each side. It's like a big line right through across mm. it. So they had from um, Dunder Street to uh, Canterbury Road and then the Hill ha family had from Canterbury Jetty Road to St Johnswood Road, and the Watsons had from St Johnswood down to Hughes Road, and right through, front to back, yeah, beach to beach. And they would lime, do lime kiln, that sort of stuff. They would uh, cut wood, and, and me being now, um, I'm a, you know in a tree business, and we kind of, and Chris has actually become a, an apprentice. Uh, done his apprenticeship in Arvest. Yeah, with Arvest. Yeah. yeah. So, so it's kind of, we, we've always been woodcutters in some form. Explain to everyone what sort of, uh, you know, the lime kilns and everything do. The, the lime, because during the um, late 1800s, or no, from 1850 right through to 1900, they were building, because of the gold rush came through, there's massive buildings through the whole of Melbourne and, uh, and Victoria. So they needed lime. But there's no cement those days, and that was mixed with sand and whatnot to form a mortar. So the whole of the peninsula is very much, it's a whole lot, there's just shelves of limestone right through. And what they would do was strip the dirt off, mine the, the limestone, put it in these kilns where they would put limestone, wood, limestone, wood, burn it down, and in the bottom of the kiln was like a big massive chimney, and the bottom of the kiln would come out virtually pure lime. Real and it was very volatile because when they bagged it, they put it on ships to go to Melbourne. And the amount of ships that you know blew up, blew up or burnt was unbelievable. <laughs> Canterbury Jetty was one of the places where they they take off and do it. Right, yeah. So that's that was the line. But it went right through to the early 1900s, and um, my family actually early 1900s, almost like a depression, late 1880s and early 1900s. My family went to Waratah Bay and did mining down there and I've got a great, great uncle that died down there too. Right. So, yeah, but all the time, wood cutting um, from late 1800s right through to 1950s, we had a wood yard at the Espens at Portsy. And Dad, we would live, Dad would live in Blair Gary and there's a, the, our original house is there. Dad was born in it. My grandma was born there. He would w walk all the way to Portsy 
and cut wood all day. He put rabbit traps all the way, and on the way back, he'd you know get the rabbits on the way back. And he'd so do what that every year day. was that? What was that? That would have been through the Depression, right? Yeah, right through the eighteen. I mean, nineteen thirties. Yep. Yeah. So no, it's always been in, in in our family. Do some sort of with wood or the lime burning too. Would, would happen too. So coming back to your personal history on the peninsula. So you were born in Gisborne and so forth. When did you move down? Here? When I was three. When you were three, yeah. right? Yeah. So your history with the ocean from there, like how did that evolve? Well, that started off with pretty much um, down the front beach because your kids were going down. We. Um, we were always look kind of because my parents had gone through, and most baby boomers, their parents have gone through wars and the depression. We'd get shellfish and we'd be picking pippies and um, whatnot, and shellfish off the piers, and we'd take them home and have a big cook up. Um, it's kind of quite funny because these days people dig up the old bits of shell and whatnot and think it's an Aboriginal mitten, but nine times out of ten it's three notes where you just bury your shells out <laughs> of the backyard. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And when we renovated the old family home in Sereno in, in, in the late 90s, we found holes and holes full of just old shellfish they'd, they'd done. But we, we started off, everyone kind of started to do a bit of snorkeling that. When, you know, we're talking like under 10 and you'd be swimming in the front beach. And the big thing was to maybe slightly be allowed to go down to the back beach. Yeah. And um, so you're in the Bay Beach and, and you want to go down there and you'd start, you'd, you'd be allowed to go down with cousins and whatnot. And as long as you watch, you could go on the surf. And, you know, I think the first memories of a lot of kids in that down at Sereno is, you know, which of course Sereno is the protected bay and where nowhere else is working, you know, that'll be there when it's massive swells. So it's getting dumped and pulling sand out of your board shorts or footy mm. shorts in those days. Yeah. Um, and that progressed from there. We would get, um, and I think a lot of, all around Australia, this happened. You get the foam board. Yeah, <laughs> there'd be yeah. zippy boards, but you get the foam <laughs> board, and that was your first board. And this is—we're talking. I probably would have been about eleven, our late sixties, and I got the foam board. And then you'd find a bit of wood and a bit of plywood, and you chop it out and you stick it in for a fin. Then <laughs> <laughs> no, no wetsuits because the problem with the foam board—you you didn't have. If you didn't wear a t-shirt, you'd come up and you'd just oh, be red completely raw. Completely rash. I, yeah. yeah. I, yeah. I think everyone knows yeah, those been that boards and everything. That, yep. that was the first board I ever had, and yep. I just think about it now and the pain of my stomach just, the <laughs> yeah. memory just comes back so and, and of course those days too no sun cream no nothing you'd just yeah. be burnt to a crisp yeah. you know, no no slip slop slap but that was kind of the first memories until you finally saved up and you were allowed your first uh, you got a fiberglass board and yeah. the local surfboard shapers were the Parkinson's the triggers were there on the more so on the west coast um, but they are there so you've saved up for your Parkinson's surfboard um, usually it was a second hand hand me down for someone and it's quite interesting because through the so where was that the Parkinson? They store? were in Blair Gary. They, right. had, they had a little shop which is used to then turn into a fish shop. Chris Cornell, one of the old the surfers that from the area to turn into a fish shop, and yeah. that was opposite the uh, just off yeah, the just, road. Yeah, across yeah, yeah. away from the caravan park. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So it, I grew up. It's kind of funny because. I don't know, I grew up we're in the early 70s, starting to surf like 70, 71, um, with a proper fiberglass board. But I didn't grow up with a mal. So we grew up when they were taking bits of boards, like a foot, a two foot. And the first boards I got were seven foot eight, seven foot five, but they were like a gun. Yeah. Yeah. And then they, you know, we went through this era. It was pretty amazing because then you'd be riding a five foot five square tail single fin, and then you'd be doing a, a six foot eight um, twin fin, and then you'd, you'd do a six foot, uh, oh, you know, like a six foot ten uh, single fin with little bonzes on it. So I, through the seventies, it was pretty wild. I ended up selling down onto just straight um, pin tail single fins. That was my beef. I loved them. And I remember one of my favourite boards was the Sean Thompson. Under licence, people were doing Sean Thompson's boards, as in the professional pro surfer yep. at that time. So, and it was an exciting time too because it was going through watching pro surfing evolve and watching – I got over bells a couple of times, but watching what was happening in, in, in a developing sport. Pretty much what I then watched with bodyboarding later on in the 80s and 90s. And you could see how things developed from, from – day one, you know, from a professional thing right through. You saw all the backroom antics. You saw, all, you know, you know, he cheated, all that yeah. sort of stuff, and trying to develop judging. And again, back to bodyboarding, watching that too. So it was pretty amazing. I think the, the biggest thing, was the thruster with surfboards. And the first time I rode a surf thruster was 82. 
And I thought it was the biggest bag of crap. It was so stiff. <laughs> because was that, was that a Simon Anderson design or yeah, that was That a... was the local board makers were then. that We had the, the Parkinson's had gone, but then we had um, Mick Pierce and Phil Grace, both right. very renowned Cause, shapers. Because Simon Anderson didn't kind of trademark the thruster, no. did he? No, he gave it to the people. Yeah. Which oh. is probably one of the best. And that was his go from then on. I was right into I still got a, a stack of tracks and old magazines from that era. And if you read through, that was his – he wanted to bequeath it to the people. He didn't want to kind of say what was going on. It would have been hard to trademark because there had been a lot of various things. Of course. From the late 70s through to the early 80s, from Bonzers getting bigger. But he was the first one that put actually three fins exactly the same – um, yeah. Size and also the rake, the way he did it too. But I, I thought it was crap, it was too stiff. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, then surfing it, um, getting used to it, because the first ones are pretty crap, but after a while they got pretty good. And from then it was just, that was it. I never surfed around, what's his name, a single fin ever again. Yeah. They are sensational boards, you know. I'm actually interested to know, like, you talked about, you know, you're surfing like, late 70s, early 80s mm. on a peninsula. What was that experience like then? Like, it, I would, in my head, I would hope there was no such thing as a crowd or anything like that. Like, what, what was that? Oh, you know what? And, it's, and sort of surfing hadn't progressed maybe necessarily down here to, you know, reefs no. and everything. So, you, you know, the best thing about the Morning Peninsula, it pr probably hasn't changed. Are you sure you want to tell people what the best thing about the Morning Peninsula is? <laughs> well, they won't. They haven't come this far. It really is a place where you still have to find someone to surf with sometimes. Yeah. yeah. You know, and it's always, and I think because of it's that rugged, we know that. You know, you, you can surf a, a, a wave here. Well, mates of mine, they go to Indo and they come back and they do the first duck dive and they get dragged back 20 foot, so you know, you know or more, mm. and they go, oh, I'm home. <laughs> uh, I think it's the power of the place, which is, you know, it, probably the, one of the most powerful spots around. So beginners, that sort of stuff, and especially girls, get put off pretty easy, you know. I mean, my daughter surfed a lot for a while, but we used to go to Point Lonsdale and over that side, and it was great fun, but here it's just, you know, it's, it's hard. Great it's for a, bodyboards. It's awesome. a very, very hard coast to learn on, and it's, it is. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It, It's a fair baptism yeah. of fire the first couple of times you get well, What I have a laugh about is the amount of breaks that are renamed, <laughs> you know, because we all – people name breaks as we're going – um, Kerwood Street and Steak and Kid was called Steak and Kidney because the McCone brothers were behind that. The day they discovered and started writing it was it probably had been written before, but lot, what you remember through the 70s, a lot of waves hadn't been written because males wouldn't handle it. All of a sudden, you develop of a short board. You could ride a lot of these waves, which are pretty heavy and very, very hollow. So the McCone brothers called it Steak and Kidney because they went home and had Steak and Kidney that day. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you know, um, the, the type Street. Surfing. Full of, full of smart people, right? Full of smart people. Geniuses. Full of, yeah, absolutely genius. Full of, like, Tiber Street's a classic because we used to call it posts. And I, I think I've told you this story before, yeah. Shane. There, there's a post on the rock near Tiber Street. And before any search and rescues or anything around here, there was a, what was called the Rocket Squad. Now, the Rocket Squads have been around for years. And that was they had a, a, a rocket and they'd fire out a line to a ship. Ah, uh, yeah. yeah. I, know, I know about this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. there's a few in the local, I think uh, Queenscliff Historical Society. It's quite the same um, some of the shipwrecks right down near where, where I live, the, the Fiji and the Murray Gabrielle, the similar yeah. kind of thing. The yeah. rocket squad were sent down from Port Campbell yeah. to try and kind of hold them steady once they'd hit the reef. So they'd fire didn't, a line out yeah, yeah. and then try and get a line back and forwards <laughs> and whatnot. But at my dad was in the rocket squad. And in the 60s, and I think it probably once the search and rescue at Sereno came in, I think it disbanded. But And we used to, they used to go down to Tiber Street, which is called now the surf break, and you could drive right down to the top of the rocks and they would fire a rocket out to the post from the dunes. And I can remember they used to use me because the, 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 I'm small. They'd stick you in a little bosun's chair and wheel you down to the post and back again. And that was the rocket squad. So we used to call it post. But then that's changed to various other different names. And now it's, called, it's named after the name of the street, which is a lot of places to call it. I think yeah. most of the surf breaks along yeah, 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 the yeah, peninsula. Pretty much, yeah, right, definitely. Right, yeah. Named yeah. after the name of the street too. Yeah. But yeah, growing up in the area was um, – look, look, it was great. I think also because we had, again – different boards. It was such an experimental stage, you know, with even fins that were curved and that sort of stuff. And it was a, it, Sorrento was a country town. I lived in Normanby Road in Sorrento and we had 
Jeff Coker, one of the local shapers down the corner of the road. Timmy Cabell, one of the best kneeboarders around, lived across the road. Um, and another couple of guys that don't surf anymore, Darren Study and um, Tim Stringer, who's now an architect. Yep. And, uh, yeah, we, we were a group in that area and everyone would r- walk from Normanby Road up to the cemetery and over the hill. You'd get to the top. If it was really big, you'd go to Strano Back Beach. If it was small, you'd go to Portsea. You'd walk to Portsea or Sphinx and whatnot. And the, the re- one reason I bought the kids back, we bought a house and redid the family home in 2000 so that my kids could kind of experience what I did, what Serena yeah. was like. But of course, it's a totally different town now. But as far as the breaks are concerned, they've changed and things, you know, with higher tides and that. But still the vibe's there and it's still very, pretty quiet really at times. You know, it's been a lot busier, especially when bodyboards come in. <laughs> <laughs> in the 80s. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was massive. Yeah. So you, who was the sort of crew you were surfing with? It's all like chasing waves and... Well, yeah, I... When I was younger, there was a whole crew. There's about 20 of us, a whole crew that all lived around the area. Um, and then I also hung around with Mick Moorhead and Frank Zambaco, the three yeah. of us. Frank went on to make Quora Surfboards and actually married Mick's wife. Yeah. <laughs> Is that Inchula Peninchula? <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> Frank, was, Frank was my first employer to the surf industry and yeah, his surf shop. So. That's right. And Michael Moorhead is my lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mike, Michael came over. As, he was the uh, Tassie champ, junior champ. Yep. And um, we used to have a ball, the three of us. We really did. We used to play, play tricks on, on uh, Frank all the time. <laughs> Frank was uh, uh, supposedly a vegetarian and wasn't eating was eating the right sort of food, and we'd buy a pack of bickies at one of our flats or something, and he'd come around to go yeah. all the time. <laughs> so we did a few little things to the bickies a few times. So you know he had to go to the toilet a lot and a few things like that. <laughs> 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 Lots of pepper, something like that. You know we knew, we, or you know also a bit of chili. That was a good one. We did that too. But no, they were, they, were, they were guys. But I grew up looking at probably people now that own the major surf shops and stuff. Stuff like Ted Bainbridge's, the, the Trigger Brothers, there was uh, the Parkinson Boys. And these guys, you know, so we looked up to them. They surfed at Sorrento, Portsea. Um, they were part of the Portsea Board Riders, which I can elaborate in a minute about that. Um, and, you know, they were, they, they were our heroes, you know, driving old combis through the 70s and whatnot, down the bottom of Sereno Back Beach used to be a, a rotunda and a ra- little roundabout there. It's all just a car park now and they'd have they'd be timing combis and that around around it and have big nights out at the rotunda, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, a lot of lot of dope, a lot of drugs around, but nothing nothing bad. Um, yeah, it was just a, it was awesome time during that time. I was yeah. going to say, do the Trigger Boys still drive those same cars? Yes. Because- <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. We also had a lot of, we had a lot of com- influx of... Um, uh, we had a couple of uh, American surfers and, and coming through. Um, Seppos, right? That's what we refer to them as. Every American Seppos. surfer nickname was Septic. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Everyone, no matter what, that's Septic. Yeah. yeah, but that was the other one from last month. No, that's Septic. <laughs> that's his name. Yeah. yeah. It was, uh, we did have a lot of people traveling. They go to Bells and they come through and whatnot. And I think because of Quarantine, a lot of people would come over and want to surf Quarantine too, because it is the ultimate kind of left hander. Yeah. They do that too. And a different coast and whatnot. Tell us about that. Tell us about Quarantine. Well, what do you want to know? I mean, there's boats called the Quarantine Express, Pete Hill. Um, a lot of us, the first time I surfed it, I walked along the back beach. Yep. All the yeah, way. Right. And that was, was that when it was still the army base? Yeah, 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 yep. yeah. Um, so restricted at that time. Yeah, yeah, yeah completely absolutely. restricted. And yep. then we, we used to do the front beach and you'd have to kind of paddle around and then paddle in front of it or walk along the beach, prefer to walk along the beach and duck down behind the wall. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, after surf, no drums, just walked up and said, oh, you know, yeah, I've been surfing and they'd pick you up and take you to the gate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it was pretty heavy. They would, yeah, they would do, you know, they'd have the guns a whole lot. It was yeah. a totally restricted area. You weren't supposed to be there. Well, um, but, you know, that, that, that base played a pretty pivotal and important role in, in protecting, you know, the oh, entrance absolutely. of Port Phillip Bay. And when we were there, it was the office at the cadet school. When Chris's mum, Carolyn, started working there, it was a bit easier because we had um, we could get in kind of any time. <laughs> I didn't surf it a lot, but we used to do a lot of diving down inside the heads. And as long as we passed the commandant a few abs, 
here and there, he'd let us. He just turned a blind eye. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and off we go. It was, it was great fun, and we could go down. I'd always throw a board or something and try and get away there if, if possible. But it, 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 it cha- again, it changes as you guys know. It changes where it goes and whatnot. The brakes kind of always there, but little things change. Sometimes crystals a lot better. So I always used to. I never used to go out and fight with a pack unless I was there by myself too. When you say this. pack, like at that time, what, what? <clears throat> it was still busy. It's always been busy. We right. had a great relationship with the guys from because it was always boats. Yeah. Um, and I used to go out, then go out with um, Graham Fry, um, who sons Chris surf with, and we could take a tinny down and whatnot. There was always boats, but we got on really well with the guys from um, Queenscliff yep. and Point Lonsdale because they come over, and we all know each other, you know, only because we surfed the point a lot together too. Although one one time there's a guy called Johnny King. He's a great mate, and he's a very short, but he's very fiery. And he's shocking the water. So we're down there one day and Johnny starts dropping in everyone. <laughs> and one of the enforcers from Queenscliff comes up and goes, what do do you know that guy? No, 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 I don't know him. No, no, he's a blowing. Don't know where he's going. She'll be right. So Graham and I just slowly paddled in. <laughs> Went around because we always used to put the boat inside the heads. Yeah. We never used to put to- tow it out where Chris kind of loses a ski. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, or do it on the boys, the buoys. So, yeah. And so we paddled in, got the boat and raced out and just we're waving to him to paddle over and threw him in and got out of there because it was got pretty heavy. And for a while there, he was banned. He couldn't go back. So I'm, I'm intrigued. I mean, you're saying some, some Queenscliff guys were trying to be the enforcers. Well, no, well, no, though, what happened is Kingy just dropped in people and he's just a loud mouth. Yeah. And he, you know. But from a geographical <laughs> standpoint, let, let's be clear, quarantine belongs to the, the peninsula, right? Yeah, not, but um, I ta- it's actually quicker. I kid you not, it's quicker by boat. From, from Point Queenscliff. Queenscliff. Or, yeah. Or the guy, look, the Queenscliff boys, we always kind of, it was kind of a shared thing. We knew, you know, I used to go over there and surf a lot of stuff, you know, not many people this side did in those days, but I used to go over there. And that was when you used to jump on a little ferry without a car. You'd have to jump on the ferry and pay the passenger and then walk to Lonnie. But um, the Queenscliff guys, we kind of, it was a really good vibe. When we were all out there and it was happening, it was awesome because no one else knew about it, you know, really that much. It's just my mate. Kingy, he's a bit of a fiery guy. And the only reason they burned up because he's big, dropping. Big shout in. out to Kingy if he's listening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Great mate, really good. Yeah, yeah. So that that was a pretty funny story. I've had some good go downs there. Probably not as bad as a, other places. I always used to come back a bit towards Crystal's, line up the little pillar box, yeah. and line have a kind of trig off off the quarantine of course their rocket self, and always kind of got the wider sets. Yeah, and I used to get lots of waves by myself doing that. There, yeah. There's some good waves down Crystal's. I've had. My best wave I ever caught out there, I had one of probably the worst beatings at the end of it. Yeah. <laughs> Snapped a leash, creased a board, lost both fins, and I had to get Sam to pick me up on the ski. Yeah. <laughs> but there was a photo of it. Well this, done. Sa- this, sounds like, <laughs> this sounds like it was recent. <laughs> it's kind of funny, though, because it's a left-hander, so I'm a, I was a natural, so it wasn't my favourite wave, but yeah. I did surf it a lot. Yeah, yeah. 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 I'd probably prefer to surf um, probably like outback, so I know. Yeah. yeah. Than, than probably surf there or Tiber or, or Central, um, but yeah, I, I like going down. It was kind of it was kind of a bit of a mystique in those days, you know. You go down, that's you know, on a boat and jump off and that sort of stuff too. And it was there's a huge mystique about the whole place, you know. Quarantine, it was kept side, don't tell anyone, all that sort of stuff too. You know, the old about the secret surf break it was never a secret surf break. Yeah. <laughs> God, you go past the boat and <laughs> through the heads and you can see where it's happening and whatnot too. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Mate, I'm. Uh, I'm actually going to rewind a little bit. We were. You were talking about yeah. the Americans, aka the Seppos. You know, it, it's such an intriguing kind of label and title or, or nickname, as you, you call it, mate. You've got a pretty interesting nickname, Spocko. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't you uh, fill us in on that? Super easy because I used to give my mate Steve Smith, who's now a really big builder. So I used to give him hell about having braces, you know, train tracks, you know, <laughs> <laughs> all sorts of stuff. And he just said, you've got pointy ears, you're Spocko. Ah. And I was eight years old. Yeah. You're eight years old. And that's You've it. had this since you're eight years old. Stuck. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And, and it was funny well, because <laughs> in my teens and, and whatnot, when you're kind of, there's a whole group of us hanging together, like 20 of us, and we'd have parties and that together and all that sort of stuff. And parents would advise us around that sort of stuff. No one knew my name. <laughs> <laughs> it was Spocko. <laughs> for, was, for, but I mean, that's, that's just, uh, that era. Go on, sorry, sorry, Ben. For reference purposes, Steve's got an extra large 
set of headphones on today. Just to cover those, <laughs> those we can't actually see his ears to verify it. Yeah. And they're still poking out the top. Yeah. I can see Betty sort of go. Yeah. <laughs> but it was funny because, I mean, you know, Australians have always had nicknames. I mean, there was Spocko, there was Dog. I mean, there was Smitty. There was, you know, it just went on and on. There's Septic. There's Zulu. Because <laughs> his parents have been to Africa, so they called yeah. him Zulu. They yeah. <laughs> were really clutching at straws. Yeah. Yeah. There was Soapy. Uh, <laughs> there was nudist because <laughs> nudist got a he um yeah he used to get, always like to strip his clothes off in public <laughs> so he, the local board makers put a nude photo yeah, of yeah. Ben Folds Ben's just got a new nickname yeah. <laughs> oh it's going to stick pretty easy isn't it? <laughs> so he had a board with a nude woman underneath the glass job yeah. nudist. Wow, there's a yep. whole stack of names you know that that went on yeah so and, no, and nine times a ten you you didn't didn't really know a people, person's full name yeah yeah. So, as a stand-up surfer, going back to that, did were you competitive at that point? Was there club? You, you're talking about mentioned the yeah, club I, before. I kind of, I've always been an admin. Um, Portsy board riders tried to start in the early '70s, and it kind of folded. But in the late '70s, we all got everyone got back together, and I was in my early twenties, and they um, we had a meeting, and I was. Chucked in as secretary. Because <laughs> right. everyone stepped back. So I was the first secretary of the official Portsy board riders. And, you know, that went for about a year and I didn't compete much. Um, I've always been an average stand up surfer, probably a bit of bodybuilder, but because I was doing a lot of admin stuff too. Uh, and then the older guys just dropped it in us. So it left me, Danny Bainbridge. Yeah, from Peninsula Surf yep. and Frank Zambaco virtually to run it. Right. And we started running it and then we we started getting a few more comps going and doing sponsorship, you know. And we were, we were young guys trying to do this, just virtually blindly trying to work out what was going on, talking to Surfing Vic or ASA then it was called. Um, and then after a while, Frank had so much spare time and whatnot, he virtually took over to do most of the stuff and whatnot and we kind of stepped back a bit. And not long after, they turned it to the pen because Portsy had such a bad reputation. <laughs> <laughs> a bad <board> name. <laughs> <laughs> like a lot of old board riders clubs, they got up to a lot of mischief, yeah. you know, um, especially at the presentation night. <laughs> so because of the, the stigma attached with brackets, stigma to the – they changed it to the pen. Of course, the pen went on for many years. After that, yeah, yeah. fantastic. Um, you mentioned Surfing Vic, yeah. How you end up working for them at some point, or working with them? Yeah, I was treasurer at one stage, right? How, Surfing Vic. How did that evolve into that? Um, that started off when, if we go back when I started bodyboarding, um, I'll go back. Probably we can even go to the history. I'll just quickly what I did yep. is that I started in '92 and. Um, there was my first comp I didn't get out. <laughs> and I started bodyboarding because, not because my kids were bodyboarding, because my mates inside Serena around Serena were all bodyboarded. Right. And a lot of generations that I've been with, surfers and that, I was in my uh, mid-30s, they'd all given up. And a lot of the guys were just, when bodyboarding came in, they were bodyboarding, so they asked me to go to the club. And I did. So I got involved with a club, and I'll uh, go on to that later on, and um, realised that, you know, Surfing Vic, and it's been my passion ever since, they're the governing body. We need to interact and, and work with them. We really do. And I started, I was on the general committee, and then at one stage I was the, the treasurer for a while. And, uh, yeah, it's been a, a, me and Tommy, or Tommy Wilson, we can go on that later too, is yep. that it's been our passion all our life. Yeah. And... My only regret about bodyboarding is probably Tommy didn't see the fruition of all the states under Surfing Australia, and that was his dream. He saw a bit of it, but not totally like it is now before he died. Yeah. Because that was our passion through the 90s. We worked. Tommy was the – he was a genius. He was the one that had to drive, and I had to try and put it together and <laughs> soften every up because Tommy's not the best people person. So I was a national coordinator, and I did – got all the people together to do it and talk to them and I talked to all the states and Tommy came up with the ideas. Going back to when you first started, so, um, you know, you you started getting into it. What what made you continue with that? You sort of tasted it and then kept going through. And- yeah, I think it was a challenge. I mean, I've been surfing boards all my life. Yeah. Um, it can get stale. I also found out I, it makes you a hell of a lot fitter in a bodyboard yeah. and I was determined. I, I couldn't get the, you know, when you couldn't get out, the first, first comp I was in, I didn't get out. It was just like, what is this thing I'm riding? You yeah. know? And, um, so I was what the, age was that? 
Uh, that was in 92. Yeah. Yeah. So I was 30, what, 34, 35. Yep. And, um, Picking up bodyboard for the first time. Yeah. Yep. And uh, I was determined to, to make this thing work. <laughs> well and truly. I thought, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And that's what I did. I just started going to the comps. And at that stage, East Coast was really, really strong and a real family oriented club when the Peen was pretty much a party club and Peninsula Surf was pretty much the same time too, you know, wasn't as family orientated as they are now. And it was a really, really well well run the club. Who was running his That was the club? um the Skeltons and the Pawsies who yep. are now moved on. Or well, the Skeltons are another fam- famous family in the area that's been around for generations and generations. The Skelton boys are still around, they've all gone to stand up and whatnot too. Yeah. But they were running a club with a a, a group of other uh, parents or mainly all parents running it. And uh, it was a great club. It was awesome. So did, would you like me to go into history, quickly go back? We'll just go back into history no, now. Go, yeah. yeah, absolutely. We'll go because, yeah. because it's kind of funny. Being in the admin side of things for the, since 92, virtually 93, I got on a committee and right through with stand-up surfing, this has kind of been my bit. And then although I've become a pretty you know competitor, I love competing too. <laughs> but going back to bodyboarding, and, we'll, and let's even go back to we're talking about how – um, how busy the, the what's the name the surf was. It never was, but through the eighties it was amazing because it went nuts. Because the eighties was this hedonistic money everywhere era, um, and right up to the eighty seven crash, there was just money like you wouldn't believe. I've never seen it. Uh, I'll never see it again. I've never seen it before or then. The bodyboarding was a new sport. It was on vogue and everyone wanted a bodyboard. And what would happen was kids from Melbourne would come down and you'd have a bus for the local bus that had 40 kids in it. And you'd be surfing Spinks and you'd look up and you'd have 40 bodyboarders walking along the beach. <laughs> and we've never seen it before, you know, yeah. bloody gut sliders. And I was sort of, what are you doing, you know? And everyone's going, da da da. It was kind of funny because when I started bodyboarding, all my mates are going, what are you doing? You know, I was just shunned because I was bodyboarding too. But I stuff it. I've always been into That was the age for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was quite amazing. So what happened in the early 80s, the very first meeting of a club or trying to get the club was 1985. And they had a meeting of people interested in forming a club in Victoria. It was down here around the corner at Truman's Road. And um, a guy called Dave Wood was, was the instigator. And if you haven't heard of Dave Wood, Dave Wood went on to be run a security company, uh, moved to the West Coast, had a security company, and then did pretty much for many, many years the security for the Wazzle, the WSL, and also um, who they were called beforehand for many, many years. So he would travel the world with his crew and they'd do all the security for the World Surf League. Okay, yeah. Not a bad gig. Yeah. <laughs> Not a bad gig. Sadly, though. Well, unless you're coming up against, say, Felipe Toledo's yeah. dad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dave's a big guy. Sadly, he, he passed, he took his own life. Um, no. and, uh, probably about eight years ago. But he was the instigator, 1985. They and, – and I've got all the minutes. On that minutes, they were going to call themselves the Peninsula Boogie Board Club Incorporated. Okay. Okay. So that was May. Come, they had their first AGM on 6th of December 1985. And uh, I've got the minutes of that. There's quite a few people around the area still here that do it. Jamie Espy, one of the guys in the Arborist trade that I know very well, he was at a, at a meeting. And I've had a few talks about it then too. And they then, at the first AGM, taught, changed it to the Victorian Bodyboard Riders Incorporated. Really? Yep. Very close to the name we have now. It yeah, is, isn't Bodyboard it? Bodyboard Victoria. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So that, that then, they drove that right through to the to the late 80s. And it, the minutes are fascinating, and I'll give you guys, you can probably read at some stage, what they went through developing a club. They had trips. And if to set the scene of the 80s in that stage, money was everywhere. Bodyboarding comps, well, I know they had Channel 7 at the Vic titles, and you would they would video everything, the old VCR, and every competitor would get a video of the, what's that, the comp. Yeah. They'd have massive stands at Portsy. Imagine the time right. put into editing back then. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then two <laughs> tapes yeah, next to each other. Individual clips. Yep. That's, that's insane. So that was huge. I mean, will we we'll see it again? I don't know. It was just money was sloshing around everywhere. Moray were putting on comps everywhere, and I still got some of the posters of the Moray comps. During that time, P 
people like Josh Morgan, who was like the young star of Victoria, they would be doing trips away every you know second or third week. They'd be going to these moray comps, and nationals were finally started. I think in late. 80s and whatnot but it was massive it was huge um through that area and that era of the 80s of course it all came a bit of a crash in the 90s yeah so what happened then with victoria that went on um and he's let's go back into into what clubs do sometimes and things there was infighting and whatnot and it split yep. and all of a sudden there was west coast and east coast and a guy called Lindsay rushback was instigator of the east coast and probably instigator of what was going on and why it all folded and a few mates of mine that I still know started the West Coast Club. And there was a lot of tension between the two of them. Right. I come so along. So good old fashioned rivalry. Oh, not just rivalry. It was just, it got pretty bad. So yeah. I come along in 92. Some and blood spilled, perhaps. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, there we go. So I come along in 92. The first state titles I went to, I was told, and I was learning to judge and that sort of stuff. I'd, I'd done stand up judging, but I hadn't done this judge. Yeah. I was told, don't trust the West Coasters and watch everything they do because they'll cheat. And you know, I heard what do you think the West Coast is <laughs> saying about you guys? Yeah, exactly the same thing because yeah. I overheard it too. The same thing. And at that title, I met a guy called Andy Cherubin and another guy called, um, what's his name, Pepper and uh, Benny Pepper. And, and we just hit it off straight away. We're both in business, both, you know, small business and that sort of stuff. And we, we just hit it off straight away. And from that time on, there was no blah, blah, da, 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 da. Within three years, we started the Victorian Bodyboard Association, which ran for about another seven or eight years after that. Um, and th we grew the sport till we had four clubs in Victoria. We had Warnable, we had West Coast, East Coast, and we also had um, uh, Cape Patterson. So what was the thoughts behind that, though? But, you know, you've obviously got clubs. Numbers. The numbers were huge. The numbers yeah. were massive. And even state titles, we'd had three state rounds, but we even had qualifiers for state rounds sometimes to get into wow. a state yeah. round. Yeah. yeah. Just what, to, number, what sort of numbers are you talking? Uh, we could easily do, you could do 200 if you really wanted, but we tried to keep it about 100 right. if possible. 100 for a state round. Yep. Yep. And then these days I'd be stoked if we got to 100. Like that is a pipe dream. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Oh, we'd, we'd have, um, you know, if you really include everyone, we'd have a lot of people there, like up to 200 if you so really how, wanted to. You, with 100 in a state round, are you, you managing to squeeze that in two days? Two days, you? just sometimes we have to run over. Yeah. Yeah, just. Mm. There was no rep, you know, rep charge. I think it was just straight through. Five-man heats. <laughs> Five-man heats. So we, you know, look, I, I kind of give it to We never did six-mans and stuff like that. Five-mans with bodybuilding is enough. We know how many ways you catch. Yeah. Your bodybuilders well, catch like twice a, as much as surface. From a judging perspective, five is and difficult. That's exactly. Yeah. That's being a head judge for many years too. That was just, five is just too hard. Yep. So we always try to keep it four. So we're pretty happy about that, the different clubs. The thing is during the during the um, 90s, pretty much by 2000, I was burned out because I was um, on the committee of our East Coast and a president at one stage. I was on the committee of VBA and president of that too. And then after going to state, I started getting my first nationals, went in 93 and met a lot of people. I met Haddon, Craig Haddon, for the first time. Yeah. Were you competing at the Nationals at this stage? Or yeah, this yeah, yeah. no, I went along and had a bit of a bash. No, the first year I didn't. I actually went along and to see how it went. The second year I did. Um, in 94, I started competing. And um, it was kind of uh, an eye opener. At, the mo at that stage, there was a company, a private company called the Australian Bodybuilding Association, who <laughs> owned the rights to bodyboarding. And they ended up leaving and wouldn't give us the Australian Bodybuilding Association. Yeah, wow. Well. Give us the name. Gotcha. So uh, there was quite a bit of a furore. And again, lots of toing and froing, and and I don't know whether it's bodyboarding, surfing in general, or the surf industry in general. Um, you know, there was a lot of people naming names, and things weren't going right, and blaming money went missing. Same old scenario. We've heard yeah. a million times. But every type of club and yeah. association yeah. has that. Like, a, yeah. so, so lo and behold, again, I got <clears throat> together a lot of people. Uh, I kind of had saw what needed to be done. I met Tommy. There that year, yep. Got up and and Tommy and I just hit it off straight away too. Yeah. You know, so tell us about your yeah, relationship with uh, Tom. Well, yeah, well, t Tommy and I have kind of brought up to he died. Always kept in touch. I mean, we drew apart once. We kind of after the nineties, but we always kept in touch. Competed against each other, and again, you know, he was just a visionary. He was he did many things. Like he's the one that started got the, the first bodybuilding comp at Chopu. He then went on to national stuff too, to international stuff yeah. too. 
Did yeah. you get involved with the Mike Stewart bodyboard coaching clinics in 93? Yeah, a yeah. little bit. Yeah. yeah. The club did. And uh, then we started doing a fair few of our own coaching clinics. We got a lot of pros down yeah. and we do it at Thurando. I don't know whether you're around then or that where we, we, we got um, – you know, quite a few yeah, pros I, down all the time. I definitely time. did the Mike Stewart one yeah. in 93. Yeah. Well, we, I remember at one stage in our, in, staying at our place in Blair Gary, we had Epo, Winger, um, I think Ryan Hardy was there and someone else. And it was, and the kids were pretty young there and it was, they were feeding, feeding them cordial and lollies and wound them up. <laughs> and they were, they were, we gave them a bedroom with some punks in and they were just wild. <laughs> they are so funny. They are really good. What was your, uh, I'm keen to, I guess get a bit of a, an understanding of like what what did those coaching clinics involve? Like what was the structure? Well, so, well, was stru- there one? The funny thing is that th- there was structure because in that during the nineties we actually had accredited coaches mm-hmm. and there was actually coaching courses. Of, you know, again the which, which you still can do. You can do, do. Yeah, 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 but it's kind of was huge because bodyboarding coaches. We, 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 most of our in our club we had seven or eight of them. Wow. You know, in the East Coast, everyone, they did the course. Surfing Vic would do it. They'd bring down maybe had or someone like that or someone to, who knew a little bit about bodyboarding and they'd add it on. So we had our own coaches, which was good because when we had nationals, we had coaches and that sort of stuff too. So it was a big deal. It was a big deal, you know, um, from coming down, uh, you know, Winger and I, pretty good, you know, and, and his dad, Phil. Phil and I would become very good mates too and right up till he died. Um, and Winger was good too. I know he had his problems, but, you know, they were just really great kids at that stage, young men, yeah. old men now. Yeah. But for me, they were kids yeah. Yeah, in their 20s. And the, they were huge. They were, they were good. It in, brought in um, a real excitement about bodyboarding and it kind of p- picked a club along and stuff like that too. And awesome. it also showed a lot of guys in the club are pretty good. Yeah. We're pretty good, just as good as probably some of these guys yeah. too. Right, give us some names. Oh, Scotty, Scotty Gardner was probably one of the really good too. You yeah. know, he was one of the, the best guys around and, and whatnot. And we, even during the 90s, we always get, we did, for a small state who only had half a dozen people, actually up to 10 to 12 at those stage, but nationals in those days, we'd have two to 300 and we'd run for a week. Yeah. So we, you know, we always did pretty well. So I was natural. I just going back. Let's backtrack a little bit. I end up becoming national coordinator. So that's the relationship I had with Tommy during the nineties. That we would. Um, uh, what would happen was what? I know, what body was that? That that was virtually through surfing um, Australia, right? You know, we had we were part of um, what's his name IBA. The IB, on, was yeah. that the IBAA? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, the, yeah, which yeah, was the- yeah. And then what's his name GOB too. Yep. yep, and you know, GOB, IBA goes on and on every different one that came in. But yep. we ran our own thing. So again, Tommy, we, we would do seminars um, around Australia, but mainly it would be at Manly, and we try and get people in for that, um, and cl- and from everyone from each state. And that was my job to try and get everyone from that state. And just quickly to explain during the nineties what happened was Surfing Australia was supposed to be the governing body, but you had. We had the VBA, Victorian Bodybuilding Association, but we worked very closely with Surfing Vic. Then you had Bodybuilding New South Wales who did want to start a deal with body, um, what's his name, Surfing New South Wales. And kind of fair enough in those days, it was a bit of a basket case. Right. You had um, Queensland Bodyboard Association too had nothing to do with Surfing Australia. And there was only us in Western Australia and the other states that had to do. So again, it was very hard to get these people along because they didn't want to talk to me or Tommy because we were supposed to be Surfing Australia people. Right. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I wasn't, but yeah, that was supposed that's why we had drama there. Um but I remember the first time we Governing fought. bodies not getting along. No. <laughs> why, why are you looking at me? Yeah. Like, what's changed? It seems <laughs> yeah. to have changed so much. Well, you know what? It's 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 funny because what's happened in the in the past, Fair Dinkum, it's all redone itself. It's always doing itself all again. You guys have experienced too what I've experienced through the nineties. Yeah. Oh, but absolutely. The biggest change was probably around about ninety five. I we did our first Manly Skiff Club event um, and Tommy put it together. We both worked pretty hard. I was on the phones for weeks and faxes. Remember these days, no internet. Mm. This is faxes. And oh, we, Jesus. We, we pretty well much got... <laughs> the noise. We, that, that sounds horrible. We got um, Western Australia to send up. Western Australia have always been an awesome state for bodyboarders and always looked after bodyboarders. They funded to have someone come over. We got someone from South Australia, someone from Tassie. And, of course, us from Victoria. And then we had to try and get Queensland. Queensland was reasonably okay because I knew quite a few guys. Going to the, I'd been to two or three nationals by then. 
So there was a guy called Harry Lino and his kids were in it. He was awesome. So Harry and a few other guys came down and New South Wales didn't want to bother to do it. So lo and behold, they were having their state titles at Avalon <laughs> up the road from Manly. And the, the, day we, the morning we started, I said to Tommy, just get things going, I'm going for a drive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I drove up to Avalon, walked around the site, found a few people, find, found Steve Kirkman and a couple other guys, introduced myself and said, guys, this is who I am. I know you don't want a bar to do with me, mate, but you're kind of going to miss out because there's a lot going to happen in the future, which did. And if you're not with us, you can keep going along with your association all that sort of stuff. That's fine. And if you don't want to talk to Surfing New South Wales, that's fine. But you, ne you need to be here. Hmm. You just need to be there. The problem is they had like 20 clubs underneath them and they're actually doing, getting some funding from the government and they just thought they didn't need anyone. But, you know, to give it Steve his go, he came along. Yep. And um, lo and behold, within about four years, he took over my job and then all of a sudden he's going to international and doing, doing the international stuff too. But, yeah, that was the start that, of us getting everyone together. And, and, you know, love or hate Tommy, they, they realised that Tommy had the right – he was, knew what he's doing. He, he, he was educated enough to do it. He had his sports education too. And, yeah, he came up with a lot of stuff. And, and not long after too, we did Chopu. Yeah. We funded that. We got funding for that. I was did the background for a lot of that. Yeah. Um, and then uh, off they went to Chopu. And by that time, Steve had then, that year, then Steve took over as a national coordinator. And, you know, the rest is history. Was that the GAB event? Mm. Yeah. The first one. That's when um, Ryan did the spin in the barrel. That was the, um, the, the source, that video, wasn't it? Remember? Yeah, Tim, there's also the, there's an Tim actual Boyson film, did the film, film Yeah, yeah. 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 So that 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 for me that was right through. It was the nineties for me was just bedlam. It was just every weekend I'd have something going. Organized chaos. I was oh yeah no it was good. I mean for our family it was full on. Our office I was also running the business, but our office is virtually no funding. We virtually funded everything through our office, the faxes, the phones, everything, whatnot, the whole lot. You know, a lot of us did the same thing. You know, tens of thousands of dollars, but you don't look at the money. You look at your passion for the sport. But, um, yeah, so I was going down also to Cape Patterson because I helped run their comps and then I'd run the East Coast comps. Wow. So, and I'd compete in both. So, yeah, in the end I got pretty good at competing. I actually did start to go okay <laughs> after that first day of trying to get out. So, tell us, tell us about your uh, competing history because, I mean, yeah, you've got state titles and so forth. Just yeah. give us a bit of a history yeah. of... I, I kind of... I've never been that competitive until I started bodyboarding. Yeah. And then I've kind of, there's something come in me, I don't know. As soon as I get in the water, you know, it's Dr. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. You're still an animal it. now, mate. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as I get in the water, I know what I want to do. I kind of, I've got to, you know, and I've probably passed this on to a lot of you guys too, and I should pass more on too. I know what I want to do. I know what I have to do. And I know how I want to work to my strengths. So, yeah. Now, within two years, I'd won the first state title for not paddling. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. From uh, getting what well, yeah washed all the way but almost yeah. back to well, the I didn't, beach. I didn't so. get out. Yep. I, I, I couldn't get past a shore break. So I, and I, then I went to nationals and I, was, I think the first couple of years I got a third and then a second. I've got the, the whole lot. But I guess in your <clears> you know, in your favour, you obviously had had plenty of experience in the ocean water, plenty through of, surfing. <clears throat> plenty of water experience. Yeah, in that absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And that that helps a lot. And that's water experience waves, on yeah. the morning to Peninsula. That's not you know no. water experience in the warm waters of the no. you know no. and northern New out, South Wales. Yeah, crappy banks and stuff yep. like that. Yeah, and then I went. Yeah, in the nineties, I won two two nationals. And I forget how many states. I think about five or six states. Who's got more trophies? You or Chris? Dad. Hundred yeah, percent. You're quick on the buzzer there, man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, I was. But yeah. But then, then just going on the history again. By 2000, we were pretty burnt out. I think 2002 we did our last comps. Chris had got into stand up surfing, was competing there and that. Um, Sammy had just started stand up surfing too, and we had a, a big break for about seven or eight years. Um, and I wanted to develop the business too. I didn't have enough time and that. And the kids were going through teenage years too. I changed business from a garden maintenance business to a tree business because garden maintenance is 24-7 with a tree business. If you don't cut a tree down, people don't freak out. But if you don't have a lawn right, they freak out. Yeah. So we had a break and then I got approached in 2011 by some guys in Rye, how do you start a bodyboard club? Who were those guys? Uh, that was Ray White, um, Eddie, 
Yep. Um, and Boggy. And um, Adam Morrison. Yep. And Jack Shepard. And I then wrote a manual how to run a club. Wrote a manual for him. This is how you do it. You know, you're going to have to come along and help us. And then it all started. <laughs> <laughs> and it all they all stood started, back and used yeah, it for it. all started again. Yeah. You know, I had the first comp. I had to show them how to judge, how to tabulate, the whole biscuit, you know, right through. Um, and to their credit, they did a pretty good job of it. And, and it was, um, I actually came up with the name because I kept coming up with these different names and said, how about just, you know, Morning Pinch the Bodyboard Club. It was going to be Roy something, you know, the Roy Charges or something like that. Wow. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and it stuck. And, you know, of course, then we went on to Victor- uh, Bodyboard in Victoria. Yeah. Which I can't come up with that name too, I think. Yeah, probably quite possibly. <laughs> I think you rehashed that name maybe. <laughs> yeah. you. Well, again, history repeats itself, doesn't it? Yeah. And absolutely. I, I want to Victorian touch on, Bodyboard Station, yeah. And I want to touch on that, mate, with, with history repeating itself. Obviously, you have, have passed that passion of the ocean on, on to your kids. Yep. Um, one of them sitting right next to us. Mate, elaborate, please. Where, yeah, I mean, you, you have obviously... Cut- I've never been some, a parent that, you know, and I've seen it. I've seen a lot of ugly parents over the years. <laughs> <laughs> Just quickly, a story, um, national titles, Redhead, Newcastle, and the parents came in after the heat of a young son. And and his mate said he won, and the parents said they won, and we actually we started videoing with the VCR every heat. For, yeah, in those full national, early yeah, days of early heat, days. heat analysis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we showed him the heat and why he lost, and he come dead. Let's don't last. Yeah. And, oh wow! And but they were what I would call the full on ugly parent. That was just like unbelievable. So um. Anyway, going back to that, I, I never pushed the kids to, to bodyboard. I never pushed them to do whatever because Chris just loved bodyboarding from well, – I've got pictures of him six. His first state title was when he was 14, 13. No, it was, you know, you're 12. 10 or 12? 10. 10. 10, 10 he was, yeah, in the, in the grommets. Um, he just loved it. Sammy, he knows a lot about bodyboarding, not a lot about you. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> It'll come to me at all. It'll come to me at all. You were 10. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and like Sammy, he uh, he was a skater and we had a half pipe in the backyard yeah. and he loved skating. And at 16, he went out on a surfboard, stood up straight away and started ripping. Which is, well, the bejeez out of me and Chris. <laughs> <laughs> I still remember the half pipe when we we bought the half pipe off um, one of dad's old employees and it like, no, actually it was off a, a mate of mine. And the half pipe, like literally, they designed like a semicircle. It was literally a half pipe, so we had to extend it. Oh, so a, no flats. Yeah, we had right. to put a flat in the middle of it, and, and then, a flat at the back. We worked on a platform. So yeah, and Dad's, Dad's like, it's going to really piss the neighbours off. Like, we're going to have to quieten it down. I reckon there was house loads of carpet. There was beach sand. Yep. Like, yep. it we was the bags quietest half You'd pipe. You full acoustified the ramp. Yeah, yep. Every yep. every kid in the neighbourhood would. Our place is a place to be. Yeah, yep. and at that stage we. I'd lived in Blair Gary a lot. We renovated the Serena home. That was around um, 2000. And uh, we decided to take the kids back to Serena again when we were elaborate before and live in Serena when they're teenage years. And it was awesome. But Sammy, Sammy was a skater. So I never pushed my kids. Olivia surfed for a while. Then she kind of lost interest. Scotty, my oldest son from a first marriage, um, and my first wife married Frank, Sam Bucko. Yeah. And Scotty... I never pushed Scotty into doing anything. And yet, even though his stepfather was a surfboard maker, he never surfed. Like body body, but he's a mad nut snowboarder. Right. Absolutely nut snowboarder. In fact, he did a year of uni up at, um, what's his name? Uh, in the mountains. Yep. Yeah. So, I've never pushed them. It's just that's that's how they've done. And, Let you them know, find it and it's, yeah, What's find your himself. take on this, Chris? No, he, he's right. And it's it's always a hard one. Now that I've got like my own children, it's like you want them to be engaged in it, but you don't want to push them into it. And I, I've, I've thought about this long and hard. You think about like dad's got four kids and they all sort of took different paths in that way. And, and I still remember like Frank shaped Scott so many boards. And I still remember one he shaped him and it had like this Dodge Viper airbrushed on the bottom of it. Like it was amazing. And Scott never wrote it. And I wrote it a fair bit. (laughs) (laughs) And and the same with Sammy. Like, Sammy is sort of, 
I always remember I'd go surfing and, you know, like surf over reefs and not think too, like I'd, I'd be okay with that. But like when it comes to skating, I'm like, you fall on concrete, you hurt yourself. Sam would like go skating and he'd bust himself up, but he didn't want to go surfing because he's like, oh, the water's deep. Like we were both at opposite ends of the scale. And then you you look at Sam and how he's sort of, uh, I guess, gotten into he, he's so into surfing now. Like, I don't know what happened rec- like in the last couple of years, but I'm pretty sure he owns more boards than I do. But, <laughs> yeah, he's, you know, he's well deep into surfing. And even when we do our, um, you know, the urban nights, he gets on a bug and he has a ball. So Yeah, Sammy's kind of always oh, used to jump on a bug now and then. And we do these surf trips. I don't know how many in an old bloody wall magna station wagon we'd fit surfboards bodyboards three kids and stuff and we'd go up the coast or we'd go to nationals and drive up and that sort of stuff too and sammy it's funny because sammy never went surfed a lot of these places until recently that he's been coming away with me at the south coast Sa- sammy has full grum froth yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, a, yeah. It's and in one, in one week we scored virtually every break in the south coast last year and it's the first time like in, he's in his 30s he's actually surfed these breaks but again going back i didn't push the kids um i am so proud of what they've done now yeah um all of you guys what you've done with um, bodybuilding victoria but what's it mean to you like with chris being president of the club oh, now and, you know and, and I, sam I, I, being head judge and- i was kind of amazed when when we had that little agm and chris put his hand up he's going to be president i said oh, all right off you go <laughs> <laughs> off you go ready good for luck the buddy <laughs> <laughs> ready for the pain. Uh, there you go. <laughs> yeah <laughs> which he, he, he said, we, we often have a few talks about some you know uh members of clubs that kind of a little bit left to center and give you a hard time and oh, they yeah. can, can stress you out a real lot you yeah know? don't know what you're talking about yeah. mate. Don't <laughs> know what you're talking about. Um, <laughs> parents that can stress you out a little bit too and that sort of stuff too but mate, it's another level and i've said to the boys and and how proud i am of them it, they've brought it to another level it's amazing where they've gone you know um you know and i must go back to it and and thank uh, Carolyn to my wife, ex-wife, because she and I did so much work together and she was the backbone of bodyboarding through the 90s as far as the admin side too, you know. She was the one doing a lot of the faxes and that, organising accommodation trips, that sort of stuff too. And we were, for many years, right up even through the, you know, from 2011 onwards, I was always usually the um, team manager at Nationals. So, and Carolyn would come along too for a lot of them too. So she did a mountain of work with the two of us, you know. And the, the, the good thing in those days is that we used to – what we did from day one going back to the 90s is that we would swap the national round, nationals around every year. Yeah. And we got to surf in some awesome places. Even like Redhead that year was pretty good at Newcastle. We had WA. Now I was at um, – what's his name? At North Point with three of us out. Yeah, um, you that know, was – yeah, the whole not, not, trip North was, Point, not, three people out. Yeah, wow. North Point was off its head. Six foot plus, yeah. Yeah. you know. Um, uh, PJ Highland was. Yeah. Yeah, PJ yeah. was out there. They decided not to have an over 35s. I was an over 35, so they only have an over 28s. So I had to surf against him, one of his mates, and there's two of three of us. By that time, it was down to a, four of us. Um, we, I think there was about. 12 or 15 in the in the supposedly in the uh, the masters they put put the 28s with us too <laughs> so uh, yeah he beat me but i got a i got a third so i was pretty happy with that i, was I don't even there. think you'd be able to get a permit to hold an event at north point you'd struggle we had we had the best trip there we like every we everything with up we surfed it yelling up engine up we surfed everywhere Carawat bay of course in the point yep and whatnot which mm-hmm. was awesome but again we got to surf uh, i didn't go to the tassie one that was in two early 2000s but with tassie south australia was awesome at york's and of course up the eastern seaboard we surfed everywhere how about the year we had it at portsey yeah portsey again right i pushed hard at, at portsey too yeah which was really good too which I, luckily i won that one so yeah that was one of the ones i got but um that was good out of the clubhouse and whatnot it worked really well portsy kind of you know wasn't the best ways at times but there was always swell and there was always ways i always used to say the guys it's funny because all my guys around australia i know oh you know i'd often send them photo shots of you know and this is i'm talking about in the last 10 years of the internet and whatnot, of our, our range of waves like nought to 15 foot Mm. Yeah, you know, and they yeah. go, "What the?" You know, and, and I said, "You come to Portsea, you'll, you'll get ways, no matter what." Well, I mean, we, we we had the best example of that with our second state title this year in Warnable. Yeah, you know, yeah. there was it, it. It's kind of a forgotten, you know, wave hub over over there on the west coast, and 
what do we have, six to eight foot? Like yeah. it's, you, look, it's, you look at that versus the other state titles I've been watching pretty keenly. Makes you feel pretty good, doesn't it? And <laughs> I, I watched, I think it was like two foot D-bar for, Queen, for Queensland. And I, I do feel pretty bad for those guys. They they put a fair bit of yeah. money behind the production value for they that had one event. foot Newey as well, didn't they? Yeah. What yeah. about yeah. Nat, New South Wales? What did they have? That, one was, foot and one Newcastle. Foot. Yeah. yeah. And then we had a ski getting people out. <laughs> like, <laughs> Water, Waterball is an awesome town. We, we used to have – they had a club there, great people. You you guys went down yeah, and Rex met. Con and all Rex that. Con, the guys day. that I used to work yep. with all the time. Rex Con actually turned up to the comp. Yeah, and, and the whole community gets behind it. Yep. Trent and, competed. And if you can only remember back – in the day too that's what happened here too like Serena used to get back through the community would get through things it was a sporting club and the same with over Kate Patterson one of the local coppers there Kate Patterson that's always had and one saggy a lot of trouble with kids and, and whatnot getting into trouble so I had a couple of local coppers on the committee and uh, and again, West Coast too was a little bit always a little bit different. West Coast that was never that community minded, but you know it, it kind of was awesome. And and going back to Warrnambool always reminds me of what it can, what it used to be like down here too. It was definitely a highlight for us this year to go back. And I think I remember surfing in Pro Junior, and it would have been two thousand and one. I reckon it was just before we sort of got out of yeah competing. Two thousand one, two thousand two. Yeah, I think it was the Moray Pro Junior when they first started doing under twenties and. Yeah, it's an epic place to, to hold an event. It's Especially if the whales are there. Yeah. Because I remember the first time I surfed there, I pad- we, the National Parks, you weren't supposed to be within 15 metres of a whale. You paddle over and, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. like, you know, like you can virtually paddle up and yeah. touch it. It's only about 10, 15 metres away. You go, oh, my God. You know, because they, they run up and down there when they're carving up and down because it's such a deep channel, of course. Yeah. Yeah, amazing, amazing stuff there. It's like that. I want to ask uh, another quick question. Obviously, we're, we're kind of on that topic of family still and, and I guess involvement in the, the sport and, and especially your your connection to Tom. Um, what did it mean to you when um, you, you heard the news that Chris won the Tom Wilson Award? Absolutely. I'm best that cry. Yep. <laughs> it was just, yeah, it was – and I'm glad they changed it. It was – I've won that award. It's, it's usually just the Achievement Award. Yeah. And, I, you know, it really made a lot – I thought it was fantastic. It actually changed the name to the Tom Wilson Award because, um, yeah, and I was stoked because – and rightly so. It was a recognition of what he'd been putting in. And, and probably re- recognition of you guys in the whole club too. That, you know, Victoria – Victoria has always been a pretty strong state when it comes to organising the rest of the bodyboarding, always. And, you know, just a recognition of what Thanks to put you. In. Yeah. <laughs> yeah we, we, we had a good platform to work with. I used to, I used to have a laugh because he's a gardener running the bloody bodyboarding in Australia. Yeah, yeah but we're, we've all got lives outside <laughs> of the sport, mate. Yeah. And I was, uh, you know, I'd go to well, ASA, it was then, or Surfing Australia, um, board meetings and stuff like that and whatnot because I was a rep and whatnot too, which we'll go in later on. We need a rep there. But, yeah, I'd be going to them and you'd get flown to places too. They had one in Phillip Island. Um, I remember... Uh, that's the one stage, um, you know, uh, Bugs Bartholomew, or Wayne Bartholomew is a surfer, Bugs, yep. very well-known um, rabbit. surfer. Rabbit. Yep. Rabbit. So, Rabbit rang up and, and I remember <laughs> Carolyn's going, that's a funny name, isn't it? Because he goes, oh, it's Rabbit here. <laughs> <laughs> that's a funny name. Rabbit. <laughs> She's like, she, taking the piss. She didn't know who Bugs was. <laughs> but he was very good. We, he was the head coach at that stage and we, uh, we had a bit to together and um, – and we're talking about – because that, that states are talking about, again, this is late 90s, they should have separate bodyboard coaching things. I said, look, and get bodyboard coaches. There's plenty around. I said, but a good coach and even the judging side of things can coach, should be able to coach bodyboarding too. Yeah. So you shouldn't just have to have just bodyboarding coaches. It should be all coaches yeah. stand up, can maybe do a little admin on the side for bodyboarding and do bodyboarding coaches too, you know. Which happened, and that's what you know. Surf and Vic did quite a few, as I said before. With the club had five or six at one stage. Yeah. So I'm actually interested here, like because you've been involved for so long. What's what's your thoughts of how it's I don't know, shrunk down to what it is now? And you know, there's not really a governing body as such. And is it? A, it's kind of is it a cycle? Is it money? Um, I think Carolyn again came up with the idea we missed out on the girls. Yeah. We should have pushed in the 2000s much harder for the girls and because the girls then went on to stand-up surfing and we missed a massive market there. Mm. Um, money, yeah, I think we won't see the heady days of the 80s for a long time. And I think 
a lot of the infighting hasn't helped. And the different associations and the different world associations hasn't helped. Um, where are we now? Where are we yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and Benny, can, <laughs> Benny, <laughs> Benny, Benny, his tongue. Yeah, Benny, yeah, yeah, yeah. And like uh, going back, I remember Chris and I always have a laugh because Chris now has a business degree about this surfing industry as a whole at times. And you've probably found that too, Shane. Sometimes yeah. there's shenanigans that get on. There's no, like, you, you have a certain set of standards when you're doing business. It doesn't apply to the surfing industry at times, um, and especially with the stand up crew and whatnot too. But I, I think if we can finally get under the umbrella of Surfing Australia, which we're not far off, but we will need to have someone as a rep. And we at each state. And mm. someone as a, as a national rep. Absolutely. Yep. Gonna take, we need that like yesterday, yep. like a year ago, like two years ago. Shane, you up for it? And then no. <laughs> too much conflict of interest. You know? <laughs> too much conflict. Yeah. Benny, you up for it? Yeah, I heard Benny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm nominating Benny. I would. It's, yeah. a, con- it's a conflict of interest <laughs> yeah. for me, so yeah. um, I'm out too. <laughs> you, get, you get all the states. You get all the states to nominate someone. Put a vote. Yeah. And then I you, don't think I have that many enemies. I think I think it I'd, doesn't matter if you, you do or not. <laughs> yeah, you know? I'm one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're in the room. <laughs> you're lucky you're on that side of the table, boy. That's <laughs> right, mate. You're a pig farmer from down the west coast, don't you? You're that's right. right. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you'll be fine. Yeah. Um, we desperately need that. Yeah. We and I think the Surf Australia of the '90s and the Surf Australia now is a totally different ball game. Totally different. Absolutely. D- d- totally different people. Um, as you know, there was a lot of through that time. There was a bias, especially for bodyboarders, and we had a lot of trauma with the states during that time. Um, and I got to talk to a lot of states, and I knew which state I could talk to and which state I was going to get nothing out of. You know, WA, South Australia, Tassie, no dramas. Queensland, good. Bushy Mitchell up there was awesome. Surfing in New South Wales, well, that was another story, but a change. New yep. people are in there, and now they run national titles, and they're awesome. Yeah. I think I think also as well for all of the organisations, uh, and this is me putting my business hat on, is that there is so much. You need a bigger hat rack, by the way. Man. <laughs> <laughs> Too many hats. hats. <laughs> but there's so much auditing and reporting in these organisations now that's trying to, like I see, you know, the, the organisations I'm a part of, the the physical, like the rules and the regulations you got to follow to have an organisation these days, is pretty strict. Yeah, and you've got to meet all those. And you know, it's things like, oh yeah, committee has to have working with children checks. Your financial statements have to be audited. You've got to be transparent in how you do things. And I think that's changed things a lot. And with, and, and, and yes, there's a lot more red tape, but I think it's also changed things. Dad and I compare notes of, you know, things we see we things that happen these days versus what happened you know in the in the 90s so to speak and even my own experiences in and being on the board of surfing Australia uh, surfing Victoria the you know the meetings and the 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 regulations we've got to go through in order for that organization to exist so just a footnote on that let's go right back to the beginning of bodyboarding Victoria just after the first AGM ever they got Gary Burns, who I know, and was on the board of Surfing Vic with him, to come over and talk to them about their association with Surfing Vic or at that stage, you know, um, Victorian Surfing Association. Right back from day one, there's, mm. they've, been, they've tried to do things and whatnot. Yep. Yep. So it's kind of – it's important. It's important that we do go there and I think when it falls into place – and we use that, um, the media, we use the funding and that, that they've got there, which is sitting there, mm. You've, but you have to get involved. Absolutely. Yeah. And Chris has found out. Yeah. And we, we'll be fine. And just requires strong leadership. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Benny? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. I've, ex- I've expressed interest. I've expressed interest. <laughs> it's on... It's- it's on file now, isn't it? <laughs> and I think, you know, we've touched on this before because, you know, each state could have, you can run, pro, we can get then go to the pro events. I mean, Chris and I have always talked about this. Um, like ABA was good, um, but, you know, for me, it felt like, you know, you had the roof on before you built the house. Um, you needed to talk to grassroots so that you could run, grassroots could have run the comps and keep the, the costing down. Um, and you start from grassroots and clubs first, then you go to states and then you go to the national and then, you know, hopefully, oh, absolutely. hopefully if we can get 
going like this, hopefully then the states then can run that pro event. Every state can run a pro event. Well, yeah, and the, be out, yeah. I guess what I, I'm, I'm focusing on for, for 2024 and, and beyond is going to that. Yeah. That method and, and, and really trying to create the pathway for success yeah. through competitive bodyboarding. That has always been kind of my vision from yeah. an administrative perspective. Uh, and what I've done at the moment is created this kind of little team of essentially state delegates or, or represent. Which uh, is rep- so important. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and that, and that's, that's the vision. So, for 2024 and beyond is to run this kind of small Pro-Am series, but each state will run their own event. So, we're kind of removing all that unnecessary overhead, keeping the operational costs down, and then anything that comes out of it from a financial perspective is going back 100% into those grassroots events and into those clubs. Yeah, and it's yep. also good because it's going to build up the capability of those clubs as well. Absolutely. You're yeah. going to be able to, yeah, essentially find the, the right people within those those state organisations that's going to help grow and develop. Yeah, and, and hopefully people are going to get paid properly too. For Absolutely. Stuff. Because we're going to get funding. You'll be able to get through Surfing Australia and what. you get yep. stuff through. Yeah. Yeah, agree 100%. Mm. Uh, it, yeah, it's exciting. I think there is a, a turnaround. I think there's with bodybuilding itself. And I think it's slow. I think probably COVID had a bit to do that too. Um, it's, it's still kind of uh, now looked at as an underground sport to a certain degree. Yep. But that's a good thing. That's a good thing, you know. And, and we can, you know, what got me into bodyboarding and, and just going back to surfing and oh, I can't surf stand up anymore because after three ear operations, I've got vertigo. Yeah. Um, and bodyboarding's got me still in the water and a lot of my mates are going, yeah, they haven't surfed for years. I said, well, get on a bodyboard. Off you go. It'll keep you fit. It'll keep you going. And the other thing it did to me, I started riding reefs on a stand up. When I used to bodyboard and stand up, I started going riding reefs a lot deeper and a lot closer and a lot shallower. Because I'd or, I had experience in a bodyboard and knew how to ride at that. A lot of places, Jubilee Points, which is a crappy old wave, but there was an inside section there you'd never ride on a surfboard. Mm. You'd just go through and pull out because it's too shallow. <laughs> you know, you fall over, hurt yourself. But um, no, no. And then you know, after riding a bodyboard, you'd go all the way through on a stand up. I think I think that brings up a really good point. That it's something I've experienced in my life is that. You know, riding a surfboard and a bodyboarding a bodyboard gives you a different perspective, and I can't think of anything that's helped either my surfing on either of them than surfing the opposite thing. I say neither for you, mate. Yeah. Neither. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm not, I'm not very good, but like, you know, uh, what, what I lack in ability, I make up for in enthusiasm, so. High five, funny. High five. <laughs> yeah, well, have, have you, uh, yeah. Does, I haven't seen you on a goat boat yet, Chris. I mean. Oh, well. Oh, jeez. You know, Eddie's Looks like we've got something bit. to find in marketplace today. Hey, uh, mate. <laughs> well, I got the I got the Nilo for the first time, so um, I think he'll that, start another club. Yeah, <laughs> I do not need that. The, Nilo, <laughs> the Nilos are already trying to poach him. because yeah. yes. we grew up with a lot of some of the best Nilos, not in only Victorian Australia. What about um? Yeah. What about surf mats back in that same era? Surf were they, mat, were yeah, they, surf were mats were huge. All the girls were, you know, it was quite sexist. Girls could surf, you know. A puberty blues. If you watch the movie Puberty Blues. It watched, is a watched car- it two weeks ago. It is a carbon yeah. copy of what I grew up with. <laughs> yeah. I'm not joking. It is on point. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> or read, or read the book, which is even more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, the it's, book it's, is it's brutal. Yeah, it's it's brutal. No, brutal. There's no fiction in that. No. That is totally on point of what I grew up with. Mates dying of over, uh, overdoses. The whole thing, the sexist thing, the whole lot. Yeah, the girls are on the mats. Off they go. But mats kind of become also a very good thing for uh, photographers. What if it was a greeno always is on a mat and that sort of stuff too. Maybe that's what I needed the other day. A surf mat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I saw a dude at Urban the other day riding a surf mat. I've read I've ridden a surf mat at Urban. And they still make them. Yeah. 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 There you go. There's, there's another thing we keep. I tell you what, guys. I feel like we've covered quite quite a fair bit, which in theory is probably still only a tip of the iceberg with you, Spocko. But um I mean, is there anything else you'd, you'd like to add before we kind of get stuck into our quick ground fire questions? No, first of all, guys, thanks for inviting me along. Um, I, I enjoy podcasts and uh, there's a local one called Salt and Peninsula about the board riders and that from the area. Yeah, that's which an excellent is, which podcast. Is an excellent podcast. Yep. And, and it's, yeah, I love that. Um, yeah, look, uh, bodyboarding is, it's funny, I've actually been bodyboarding almost as long as I'm stand-up surfing. Um, and bodyboarding is bought in something of me that I never had, uh, like a mad competitive 
person, you know. And even when I went back, I won another three national titles, and you know, through the 2011 onwards, and, and I never thought I'd do it. The only thing I'm, I'm dirty on is that I'm 60, almost 65, and I have to surf against 45 year olds. Yeah. So I've been pushing to have another. Division, the added division. To the- well, I was pushing for over 55, but by the time that comes along, I'll be over 65. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll be pushing for that and I'll be pushing for everyone in a day. I know. That's, that's called progression. Yeah, oh. I'll, but mate, Greggy Chambers is what, Jerry's two years older than me and he was pushing for over 65 for a long time, for a while too. So. Well, I mean, there's, there's a significant amount of, of, of bodyboarders well, in that age bracket. That I'm still, just hoping... Still not to go on too much, that they realise, and again, we have to go through the states and push hard for more numbers, to realise that there are junior bodyboarders, but the majority are now much older. Absolutely. And, and they need to expand at national titles yep. that those groups of over 35, over 45, and get them over 55 too, because they're losing the older guys, the much older guys. We could replicate the divisions that the Mel's run. Yeah. I think they even run like an over... I think there's an over 70s in the Mel's yeah. at Nationals. Is it really? Yeah. So there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to push. Yeah. I, I agree. Like the whole demographic. We need someone on the board at Surfing Vic to, that can speak to <laughs> Surfing Australia. Do you know anyone, Chris? No. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, just, I still get excited by a new board and a new wetsuit. And it's... I, I remember years back the first block of wax I ever opened up and the first board I actually waxed. And the smell of the resin, because no, used to fix boards and that that sort of stuff. For me, it's body. And body since is- now, you've lost all sense of smell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and hearing, dead yeah, yeah, hearing. <laughs> um, but for me, still the passion of opening up a wrapper or getting on to the website, seeing what change got coming on, which I did this morning, you know, and or getting another pair of fins and trying to get that horrible rubber smell off your hands for a week, um, you know, that still gets me going. Um, and I'm about to go away, so I will be going and probably looking for another board. Um, probably don't need one, but I, I do don't know one. anyone that can yeah. do that for you. So, so you know, where where are you heading this time? Uh, coast? South coast, South coast. Yep, South coast. Yep. I've, I've where's your spot. Where's your go to wave on the south coast? S- south coast is based in a little place called Bar- Barraga Bay, just south of Bermagui. Yeah. Okay. And it's 20 minutes to Naruma. It's an hour and a bit, just an hour and a bit to Batemans. It's 45 minutes to, or an hour to Pambula, and it's right in the middle, and there's plenty of swell. And then I've got lots of waves. I surf um, around that area, often by myself, that are most of the rocks through there too. And if I really want to get excited, I might even race up to Kayama. Um, but I haven't had to do that yet. So that's my go-to spot. has been for years and years. My first trip was in- Stop off at Hato's Pies and Dollar on yep. the way through. <laughs> you beauty. <laughs> yep. Um Probably my first surf trip was in 73 and then we did it and we took a whole lot of station wagons. I think it took 10 hours to get to Marimbula. It was part of the road. We had old motorbikes and utes and all sorts of stuff, yeah. and we camped in Tafra for a week. Yeah. And there's still no fuel between all Boston and Marine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And to be clear, now it's six hours. But, but yeah. that, I still get the thrill at 65 of that new board, want to get out there, you know, and I'm still trying to do, trying to do moves that I can't do yet. I still want to try and reverse on a bloody wall or do a forward spin and a left. I do just, you know, there's, there's lots of things I still want to do yep. and I'm still trying to do as long as I'm fit and can keep, keep getting out there. Well, that's it. As long as you can get out, yep. I'm you still can doing do it. it. I'm still doing it. I'm still waiting for that, you know. Can't wait out the back. Serena works. It's solid and heavy. Yep. <laughs> Jumping in it. Yeah. Where, where's your current – I'm probably jumping ahead here, but where's like here you on are. the peninsula? You're hitting the quick – Quick fire questions. No, 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 this this is, isn't even in the quick yeah. fires. But here on the peninsula, where where's your go to at home? Outback. Outbacks. Yeah. Inside or outback. That's yours too, Shannon. Right? Can you beep that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because no one knows where it no is. No one knows where it is. That, you want me to send a map pin? We had a state titles there this year. <laughs> yeah, we did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that was awesome. The first, it was probably the second time we had a state titles. Yeah. yeah. You know, oh, we had one, and I remember Perth came down from uh, Cronulla and a few of the Cronulla boys, and he went right out the back to that left hand and went as big as yeah, right. the left hand. And we yeah. went, oh, what the? It is because um, it's a history thing. It's where I grew up surfing, where the boys grew up surfing. Um, Blair Gary's kind of our really our ha- hometown, but Serrano is too. Uh, you know, my forefathers went went there with down at Spinks Beach, which is the uh, the Strano end of Portsea. There's a little rock pool there, and seven generations, or I haven't taken the boys there yet, yep. have swam in that little rock pool. You know, Epic, you know, and epic. Uh, 
you know, it, it's it's just something that um, you know I love. Uh, I love surfing all sorts of breaks in other places, but you know, when I'm home, I, I don't think you can get the power anywhere else or that intense bit of out the back when it's on. It's pretty full on. You know, I snap many surfboards up there out there when I used to surf, and um, we're talking boards with lots of fiberglass. I mean, not thin boards like today. We used to snap them and pull fins out in it all the time. So it's always a challenge. Out the back strand is always a challenge. I, Absolutely. Just one thing I'd like to bring up about that. I like the way that, you know, there's a few people that can paddle out and get waves and they go all right and, uh, you know, yourself, Shane, you'll paddle out and get a wave past most people and I do all right out there, but there's one person that always burns me out there and that's Dad. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a, the father-son father rule. Father 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 you get the drop in at least twice. Yeah. <laughs> Although I did it once, I did a spin and I, I clocked you in the face. <laughs> kicked, me, kicked me in the head. Like, you ever had a manta blade to the face? <laughs> that's, the, that's worse than the spatula. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember we... we come home and we were surfing with a bloke called Brendan Delaney and he rings up back in the day when you had the old landline he rings up and mum answers the phone and Brendan's like oh hi Carolyn yeah just checking to see how Chris is like Steve kicked him in the head because <laughs> <laughs> like, he could cuss or anything like that anyway mum knew about it next day she took me to the doctor and the doctor's like what happened I said dad kicked me in the head while wearing a flipper <laughs> and mum's like surf. don't so say that <laughs> <come around." laughs> just, the, just quickly the funniest day was I was coaching kids at um, Diamond Bay bodyboarders and I, I tore a muscle in my leg I thought somebody hit me in the back of the leg with a rock that's what it felt like I had to try and gimp my way up the, up the, the, the old stairs. sniper in the hill yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. and um, so I get to the uh, casualty at Rosebud to see what's going on Chris turns up he hit the rock ledge and he's put his teeth right through the bottom of his lip and blood pissing out <laughs> <laughs> yep um, but knows what was going on yep family services yep. may or may not have been called that yeah, day yeah, pretty good. not the first or last time Chris has done that either no, I've, no, <laughs> no. I've held him down and in, 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 what's his name in uh, what's his name casualty at Rosebud too when I had to stitch his head yeah. up <laughs> Oh. Dad, Dad rings mum and goes, Chris is here to reef. What do I do? Mum's like, take him to the hospital. <laughs> uh, All right. We might get into the quick fire question, uh, question rounds and uh, get to know you a, bit, a little bit better as well. Favourite band? Neil Young. Oh, Neil Young followed probably closely by the Eagles. Yeah, Good bands. Yeah. Good tunes. Yeah. Favourite film? Gladiator. <laughs> Gladiator. Yep. Did yep. you hear they're making a second? Oh, you're not entertained. <laughs> oh, you know, <laughs> growing up in the 60s, men in skirts, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and you remember the, 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 the old um, Spartacus, Spartacus movie? Yeah, yeah. Spartacus. You know, they, they'd say something in their mouth would move. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 That stuff. Yeah, that was pretty funny. <laughs> Favourite car? Uh, the Rangers. I've had seven of them now. Self Ford right. Ranger, yeah. yeah. Start off with Holden's, but yeah. What's your take on Rangers, yeah, on Rangers Chris? Chris? Yeah, no, you haven't got one anymore. I don't have one anymore. No, no. you got to borrow the old man's. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they're, 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 there's new wheels coming, but we'll me, Chris, probably I've done a lot to Rangers that no one should do, like towing three ton chippers and tracks and yep. up hills, and and then you know driving in New South Wales the next day. Chris has probably done more extreme stuff than I have, yep. like on the sides and stuff like that. Too. Yeah, but little... they're unbraked. They're pretty good. Yeah, yeah, we've so. had Land Cruisers, we've had all sorts of cars in four-wheel drives, but, yeah, the Ranger. I just can't be trusted with transmissions, so that's all. <laughs> <Yeah. true. laughs> uh, Favourite TV show? Oh, that's a good question. Poldark. Poldark? Poldark was that's a Pommy the, show. Yeah, the cop show? No, no, Poldark was a period show set um, in Cornwall. From right. the eighteen hundreds, yeah, right. Yeah. It was it was what, done in. What was the storyline? Yeah, it was a storyline about this this guy who comes back from the uh, Civil War in the eighteen hundreds, and he's actually a nobleman with no money, and how his his family, his brother, then um, takes over the, his his ex wife. His wife deserts him because they thought he's dead. Hmm. So the wife Spoiler married. Spoiler alert for anyone listening. It's <laughs> <laughs> a bold act. The, the wife marries his worst enemy and takes over the estate. He's left with a little bit on the, you know, a crappy little thing on the side. And Streaming it, now on Netflix. <laughs> well, it was in the 70s and then it was redone in the yeah, 90s. It sounds familiar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 No, it's an awesome show. It really is. There's a whole stack of others, but that's probably one of my favourites, oh, I'd say. Yeah, yeah. Favourite bodyboarding. And we talked about that. Enough said because it was kind of. Early to mid 90s, it had a bit of everything. 
Um, and a favourite bit going to the next one was Rochi doing his flurry in the tail because he's an awesome knee, um, drop knee. I'm not a great drop knee fan. I think Benny isn't either, but um, <laughs> oh, <laughs> <laughs> ben, ben, Benny loves drop knee. He's really yeah, good at it. Yeah, but just the um, Rochi had he had such a bloody well. He's such a character and whatnot. So you know. It was pretty good. Um, probably the the other second runner up would be the the, the one they did on um, what's his name Shark Island, the Cronulla boys. Yep, that was probably because I knew all of them. Yep, and I knew the story. The underground tapes. Yep. yep. Oh, yep. No, oh, the doco. No, no. oh, 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 skid kids. Yes, yeah, skid kids. Got. It. Yep. Loved yep. it. Yeah. Holding on. Yep. Yeah. Because oh, oh, that's what it's called. Yeah, Sorry, holding I, on. Yeah. yeah. You know, I knew knew all of them. Yeah. So you know, it was, it was pretty good. You know, and they did pretty good. good uh, was it our soundtrack years ago? They did. Remember that one? At the back. Oh, no. Oh, don't. 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 And I think that that, in tip of, <laughs> that, that is the 80s in a nutshell. Um, you know, Sam gets yeah. fined every time he brings up that out so the back. So, what was the name of it? What was the name of the things that, as he's judging? What was the name of that song? And it was the bodyboarders and that. And it was a bodyboarder singing it. That's Brett Young. Brett Brett Young. Young. Yeah, 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 yeah. I still remember And that. the guy's walking over the hill with those yeah. reflector shades, the fluoro stuff. This is the stuff. time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 and it would have been thousands going to that, that stage. And that was the 80s. That kind of epitomises where the money was yeah. going. I love it. Yeah, Hawkey, yeah, Hawkey we'll, we'll over the hill. Yeah. Yeah. And Brett Young ended up being on Hey Aids that day, I think, at the time. Yeah. Because Molly was part of that, producing yeah. that, I think, as well. Oh, yeah. I love Brett, um, Hawkey in, that, in, in holding on, and he goes... I don't know what the fuck I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> pure so honesty. Yeah, yeah. Well, pure honesty. Uh, have you ever been mistaken for someone famous? Nah, because I haven't been near the bloody well, what's name Star Trek web on its own site. So, just nah. Dr. Spock. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nah. <laughs> uh, what was your first board? Surfboard or bodyboard? Bodyboard. Max 7 7. Yeah. Bang. Straight on it. Second hander. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Had a few since then. <laughs> yeah. What's your current board? Um, it's a Joe Clark. Yep. And I'll elaborate that in a minute. Yeah, with favourite boards. <laughs> <laughs> favourite wave? Pamela Rivermouth. I've only scored it three times. The last time with Sammy, uh, my youngest son, we got in a week, we got Pamela Rivermouth, Marimbula Rivermouth. We've got Ooh. Naruma Breakwall going firing. Oh. There's a whole stack of ways we've got in a week. And Chris and I have done 20 years trying to get all those ways and Sammy Tinas got them all. Right. Oh, <laughs> poor and Chris. It's, it's one of those enigmas. It never very broke. This time it breaks very well. This time it did and it threw out. And the guys that have surfed it really good, the the, the tube, you can you know, you know you have about a, a party inside it. It just throws right out. And probably the bodyboard was the, the, the craft to have because I was the only one kind of making them. Yeah. Um, as the tide kind of changed, it was. It was a bit, solid six foot. It comes up from nowhere and just throws. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I surf lots of ways, but, you know, I mean, North Point was pretty close, but, yeah, that's probably it. Favourite surf trip? Probably when we went to WA Nationals. Yep. Surfed everywhere with only a few of us out. Oh, just one key point about the WA Nationals. That was the one where... Um Mum and Dad thought they were going away for a trip by themselves, and then I qualified. <laughs> <laughs> How was that trip? That was good. well. In the end, we Surf was good, but <laughs> this is the size of time. We had three minibuses. Yeah, we had we we looked after the young kids, so under uh, sixteen, under eighteen in our bus. We had another bus with kind of, well, I call them the mid range crew. They were like the men's and that sort of stuff. Uh, and then we had the open guys had their own bus, and they went off. They're all over eighteen, so they went off. And, in the vineyards and all that stuff too. It's pretty good. Yeah. yeah. I've heard a rumour as well talking about surf trips that um that Dad has been known to uh, try and slip two minibuses behind each other to get through boom gates yeah. and caravan bus. <laughs> yep. And the boom gate come down Got and down. Then everyone's Bang. kicking the roof back up. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> we're pretty good at – we did one from Newcastle and we had three buses and we were pretty good at driving and changing drivers. <laughs> Still going. <laughs> oh, wow. We drove Newcastle to Melbourne in one night. Yeah, which was a pretty good effort. <laughs> Left at five in the morning, got there in the next morning. Yeah. <laughs> Favorite move? The Rollo. Rollo. Yep. It's the only thing I can do any good. <laughs> <laughs> it's still a very good move. Yeah. Yep. Extended arms or clo close to the torso? Uh, it depends on what size wave it is. Yeah, if it's small, you're going to push out and put your arms out. And it. You're forcing it. <laughs> going but for that extra half a if point. If it's big, you try and hold it in, you just hold your breath. And that's why, for the for the viewers, 
that's why there's a lump on my thumb because <laughs> <laughs> I landed a roll out the back. And, Popped it? And just went. <laughs> no, I broke it. Didn't even know. Oh, wow. Oh. Yeah, yeah. I've broken a few things. Didn't even know. Actually, I've broken my back and too recently. I didn't know. Just that, from carrying carrying Chris, Chris, Chris around? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All these years. Three kids. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, yep. <laughs> Favourite board? Um, it's not a favourite board. It's the favourite shape, and it's been the same all along, pretty much right back to E2, to the mores. And if I put my board, my current Joe Clark against it, it's pretty well close to the E2, to the mores, to the Versus. I've had two. It's all pretty much the same plane shape. I don't know what it is. Um, well, you know, I don't look under the bottom of the car too much. But again, it's the same shape all the time. Don't 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 peel back the layers with a bodyboard. That's not good no, for no, it. No, no. <laughs> there's so, there's yeah, no, no wood. It's, 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 I don't know why that that shape is. It's it's fifty fifty rails. Um, always like boards with lots of mesh. Um, I, I find a big difference with the mesh that's in there. For some reason, I can feel it, uh, and I'm loving the channels. And I'm actually running two boards because if it's small and flat, I'll run just uh, the Joe Clark. Same board, same mesh, no channels. Same size? Uh, 30. Gone up, uh, um, what's the name? Not 30. What's his name? 43. Okay. Gone up to 43. For years, I rode 41 and a half. Um, then I've been riding 42s. And yeah, no, and I, the, the channels, that's a 42, I think. It is, or 42 and a half. Yeah. Uh, the 42 and a half. 42 and a half. Yeah. yeah. These board makers, they have all these weird, you can't get a 42 and one and, you know, 43 now. Yeah. I don't know what they do on what they're on. Yeah. It must be from their 70s smoking something. But yeah, so that's kind of my favorite board. But the channels, I find a huge difference, especially out the back if it's hollow, if it's New South, if it's really hollow. Yeah. What, one thing I found really bizarre over the, you know, the last 25 odd years or so that we, we've been bodyboarding together, Dad is that you and I could walk into a shop and there could be a whole range of boards and we'd pick exactly the same, same board. Yeah. yeah, We've been riding the same thing. I've got Joe Clark's as well. Um, I bought a vintage E2 uh, recently that is mint. It's, it's yeah, I've good. kind of, I've, over the hundreds of bodyboards I've had, I've kept the ones I've kind of won national titles on. Yep. And I've caught my E2 because that was an all-time favourite of that era. Right. How, how big's your collection, Steve? It's not that big. Not that big. How many boards Lucky you didn't keep there? it in Chris's We've got shed. about 20 boards. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I think well. there's a few on my boards. I've been boards smoke there. tour. Yeah. I've been smoke tour. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I was going to say the... Uh, that's the only thing. That's the only thing a bodyboard wouldn't survive, a fire. Yeah. It's nuclear holocaust. They saw them the cockroaches would survive that. <laughs> so it would survive everything else. Wow. <laughs> we, we were talking about my ability to ship boards in aeroplanes without board bags yep. that um, quite good at. But I think about 30, 20 or 30 boards. I've gave a lot away recently. We, there was a, a, a – um, down at Serrano, these crew kids came out um, as a youth group from down at uh, – somewhere down, down Taralgon somewhere, and they had all these crappy boards. And uh, mum and dad was running a youth club, group in a copper, and they were all terrible boards. And I said, come home. So they finished their surf. We had a great surf together. There was about a half a dozen kids and mum and dad. And I said, come home. And I handed them over with six boards. So there you take these. I'm not even going to ride them again. You're a bloody legend, yeah. Steve. So, yeah, we've, we've cut it down. We've got a few surfboards there too. I, yeah. I was um, – one of the boards I've been chasing, I'm not really into the vintage boards, but one of the boards I've been chasing for a while, dad and I, uh, I reckon it must have been 98 – must be 98, 97, actually 98, because we went to one of the things with um, in Sydney and then we went back down the coast. And I remember we stayed at Durris and it was the, well, we stayed at uh, South Durris, was it? Yeah, 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 yeah. And at the time I was riding uh, a fangs board that come out of the factory. Wow. That um, Ross Hawke was running the factory. Yeah. So Hawke he was doing um, BZs. Uh, BSDs. BSDs, yeah. He was doing BSDs and <coughs> we went to um, the factory. And Fangs. And I remember I had this, this Fangs board, like it's still in my memory now. And it had a special, it was one of the trial boards. It had a deck skin on it that was like super abrasive. Like was it like the, sca like the scaly abrasive Gator, stuff? No, yeah. it, was like it was actually they. they Pulled the the paper off a package or something and yeah. put it on. It was some some weird stuff they'd done. Hawkey had done. Right. Didn't and Unison do that as well for a while with their boards? I, it was like sandpaper. Oh, they yeah. had the Gator Grip, yeah, Gator yeah grip. which so, is the, what Manny used to do. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I had this board, and then 
I remember at the time, Dad was writing uh, 42 Manta concept. Yep. And I don't know if you remember the concept, but it had... It was probably the first board with quad channels. And so it had like this weird tail with two lumps, like a bat tail with lump, like a little crescent bit cut out of it, like handrails all the way through it. And Dad and I had ordered new boards off Hawkey at the time from BSD. So, um, you know, we were hanging out and we were going to see him the next couple of days. We were going to pick up those we had, That was good, that trip. We had, Tamiga was there. Yeah, yeah. And we surfed with Tamiga. We yeah. surfed with Dave Ballard on a yeah. surfboard. Had like, a board. And um, still got a photo. It was pretty epic. And anyway, we went for a surf and um, you had to paddle. I'm pretty sure that was the one you had to paddle across the lake. And Dad and I went for a surf and we were the only people in this whole like caravan park. So we left out like stuff on the on the balcony overnight. On the balcony overnight. You overnight. Do. So yeah. wetsuits hanging out, Sam's socks and shoes. Wake up in the morning, gone. everything's gone. gone. Like the whole thing. And I still remember like... Um, Dad was like, they called the police and stuff like that. And the cop was like, oh, I suppose you want to claim insurance. And Dad's like, no, it's like, I don't give a shit about the value of it. I want to just want that board. Board. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <It's back. laughs> and um, that's one thing I've been trying to find uh, vintage wise is a concept. And they're really bloody hard to find. And I haven't told Dad this, but I got approached by a gentleman from Vintage Bodyboarders recently. And uh, he had a concept that I he told was- you not to talk to strange men. So <laughs> 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 there's plenty of strange men on there. <laughs> I'm, do- whack of it. <laughs> I'm, do- I'm, do- I'm doing a, a, a podcast with two strange yeah. men. But anyway, so um, this this guy reached out to me, and I'd seen a post where he had a concept, and he's like, "I'm looking at it's in rough condition, but I'm looking at getting it redone." And um, I said, "I'm looking for one. If anyone knows of one." I want preferably a blue one these years, da-da-da. And uh, this bloke reaches out to me and he's like, if you want it, it's yours, Pay oh, as long as you pay postage. So, I've got a concept coming down. We're cool. going to have to get it reskinned. <laughs> but I don't know where to do that. And funnily enough, I stole it on the south coast. <laughs> 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 so just going back to Sammy, all those years Sammy didn't surf or any, but it was, we had some funny moments. Like when we surfed with Tamiga, next thing Tamiga's in the car, and Sammy's got his little, you know those little um, handheld PlayStation things. Game Boys. Like Game Boys yeah. and that. Yeah. And then him and Tamiga has been to like we four hours. Like, gone. Where's he gone? Sammy's in the back and they're going like this having fun playing a game boy yeah. <laughs> and um, at one stage down at uh, when the uh, Trigger Brothers used to have a surf shop down at the bottom of Sorrento yep. near the pier there um, Pete Wilco who was running it and later on worked for me um, rang up and said oh we've got some pros coming over you want to come and get some autographs so we go yeah this pros come over there's um, Dog Marsh uh, Lisa Anderson this guy called Kelly Slater yeah, and so Matt Hoy yeah, Matt yeah. Hoy yeah. and um Sam, everyone's there getting their T-shirts, boards and that, sign that. And Sammy takes up a Raptors basketball card. Raptors. And gives it to Kelly to sign because he thought he was a basketball. He didn't know where he was. <laughs> he's a young kid. And, and, and Kelly going, cool, Raptors, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've got the, uh, this was the like one or two years where they actually made surfing like trading cards. Yeah, yeah. I've still got some. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I've got the, the full ASP, set. Yep. And I've got Lisa Anderson, like Matt Hoy and, and I think Dog I've got Marsh. a Kelly Slater redemption card. You were supposed to send it back in and get a prize, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think. I think I've got a Kelly Slater Baywatch card. <laughs> oh, you would too. <laughs> <laughs> and his speedos. And, I, and I've told you not to talk to strange men. What are you doing? <laughs> That's twice now, Chris. That's twice now. <laughs> yeah, wow. Well, yeah. yeah. But Sammy's always been, you know, he's on the side, but he's always kind of a bit of left to centre and always seems to do something that we're, yeah we lost to mega yeah he went in from the surf he left early he's in there for hours of sammy in the back of the car <laughs> there go. oh dear so as we start winding up um i was actually more interested chris have a question for you like obviously your father always means you know everyone's father means yep. the most to them type of thing but i'm sort of interested you know you really followed you know, sort of his pathway as well. Yep. So I was sort of interested to see sort of what you, what he means to you in that way, you know, not just as a father, but, you know, in, in that sort of thing. Oh, look, it's, um, you know, watching what dad's done for the sport and how much effort he's put in and, and time and seeing him, like you said, in those, uh, those late 90s putting, you know, sending faxes and all that sort of stuff. And it's, um, you know, it's sort of driven me to, to push myself and get into it. And it wasn't, 
sort of something that I'd thought about doing, but I don't, look, I don't even know how I ended up in administration for for bodyboarding. Or no one does, but <laughs> no one does. <laughs> but, but here we are. <laughs> but yeah, look, you know, um, you know, seeing what Dad's achieved has really driven me, and also like him, competitive. He's far more competitive than I am. Um, I wish it, it's like you and your brother. Your brother is pretty bloody competitive and i'm not <laughs> yeah and it's um like seeing dad's passion like you see dad <laughs> roll over like this much reef like down I've it. Got, I, I looked in the old the box i've got here of all the history of bodybuilding that i've kept the um what's his name that the heat sheet of that uh, state titles because i was we, i was losing it we had two rounds and this young 45 year old come in you know and i'm 60 yeah and um so i thought i'm gonna have to do something drastic because the first round i lost mm. i thought i would get a big score i needed like a nine or a ten or something so yeah i went in at rye and i said oh well let's go and did a roll on the reef <laughs> <laughs> and then i did the second one so i got a 10 yeah the highest heat school i've ever got i think it was 19 that's he, what you get for rolling on dry reef he didn't get a cooler though no, yeah. no getting cooler but yeah you know um <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, um, but yeah, it has been like a you know great influence, and oh, like I said to you when we did it, uh, my one um, when I was at nationals last year, and I won the, the Tom Wilson thing. The first person I wanted to call was Dad. Yeah, and I knew that it'd, it'd mean a fair bit. So yeah, absolutely, um, you know, like I, I always, like I've said previously, I've always hoped that you know we're. You want to, you know, dad spent all this time like um, working with bodyboarding and all the rest of it and, and growing the sport and whatnot. And I always hope that, you know, um, always hope that dad and, and I guess other people as well are happy or, or proud of what we've done to try and change it and, and you know, what we foresee in the future. So, but um, yeah. Oh, I'm so proud. It's not funny. Yeah. You know, and isn't it funny we're sitting here... Victorians, good Victorian. Now we're going. I was born, born and bred. No, you were born and bred. Went away for a while. Well, we'll, we'll forgive you for running away for a while. To the the Polak, you know. But you know that hopefully, again, bodybuilding in Australia is going to come from here, which has had to happen in the past. Yeah. 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 Well, I think I think we're making some pretty good headway. Yeah, Yeah, I think so. Well, a lot of that's thanks to you, Spocko. Um, You've been a mentor. To the boys, you've been a mentor to me, and you've been a mentor to so many other people. Um, you know, through the running of the club down here, and you know, through the state and through in, and uh, throughout the country as well. So, you know, we really appreciate you coming on because uh, it's really good to have that history yep. sort of talked about as well. Yeah, it's awesome. I, I'm enjoying talking about because you don't get to talk about it too much yep. to, to, to different people. A lot of people don't know. You know what I've just talked about. A lot of stuff there, people got no idea. Yeah, so it's awesome. I've loved it. Loved it. Well, awesome. mate, yeah, on, on behalf of myself, Shane, and, and of course, Chris, thanks for taking the time to chat with us on the Closeout Bodyboarding Podcast, mate. Um, and yeah, I, look, I want to essentially just mirror exactly what Shane said, mate. I, I, I drew inspiration from a lot of the, the groundwork you put into the sport. So um, thank you very much. And um, yeah, definitely drew some inspiration from chatting to you tonight to, to keep moving forward. So yeah. Um, Yeah, without further ado, thanks so much, everyone, for tuning in. Big shout out to uh, the team at Limited Edition Surf Hardware for supporting the podcast uh, and also to Michael Jennings and Sam Watson in production and also Rob Porteous uh, from Remote for the Music. See you guys next time. See you later. See ya. Bye.